in the ether. So, bang, we're, we're starting with a false statement there. And then you're saying to get a mic is going to cost you five bucks. So it's like saying, OK, to disprove your lie, I have to pay to disprove it. So that in itself is a grifting situation. Or you could uh, pay the five bucks to agree with them, kind of like McToon's crowd does. But it seems like McToon. Well, oh, well, well, well like... to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, I, I give more. Fuck. Well, how can I say this? I give more uh, of my attention and emotional support to Sacred Space than I have ever given to McToon. Like I, I hear what he's saying, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna fucking go out of my fucking pocket and start dumping money into him. No, absolutely not. I would buy a fucking flat earth sacred uh, Hey man, throw me a 3.6. Throw me a half before, inch. Before Dude, it's I would uh, like, uh, before I would supply you. Let me get a QP. I mean. Let me get a QP. Hold on, hold on. What are we talking about? QP? I, oh, girl, you're on large. Girl, okay, that's it. Girl, you better calm down not tease me with a good time. So it Go sounds ahead, like tap in with Telegram. It sounds like Mattoon uh, and those guys can uh, make money if they believe in what they're talking about, but Jaredism can't make money if he believes in what he talks about. It's not that. The, 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 the caveat is the way he presented it. If he never said, hey, hashtag free money, I don't need to do this. I've only made $600. I'm not doing it for the money. There's Why say all that, right? Making it seem that you're trying to be this altruistic person who's trying to help out the community. If you wanted to do that, you would start out, you, you, you wouldn't have any ways to, to fund you or to list you or to promote you on your page, right? People would have to constantly be asking you the way sacred says that he has to, you know, constantly deny it. So it's all in the way he went about it and the way he went about it was kind of grifty. You called kind him of out grifty. For, you called him out <laughs> for something you were watching on a YouTube channel. And then you're mad at his reply, though. Your your first initial inquiry to why he has his cash up up there was very uh, aggressive. It was very, like, condescending. You weren't asking from a good place. You were being a condescending glober. That's exactly what it was. So it's like, mm. for you to say, well, why did he come reply like to that? It's say, like, well, you can't. To say, say like that, that you can 100% pick up on emotions through text may have a little bit of projection onto it. Because I, I just asked it as a question. I didn't try to come off hot. I mean, in this room, when do you ever hear me coming off hot? So it, it's like I said, it's it's kind of hard. To about LIGO? I ain't hear about LIGO since. Uh, uh, see, because... Uh, when, uh, when, okay, I'm like, we, there's we one thing that LIGO, I wanted right, to right, mention right. in this all here. It's go like, ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> what, uh, the algorithm <laughs> is 100% against somebody who wants to speak his truth about true earth. Uh, while you can easily make a joke video about flat earthers and you are automatically put in the first category of uh, options if you just search for it on YouTube. So it's a lot easier to be a grifter as an anti-flat earther than a person who is trying to figure out the truth and talk about it. How I view it, it's kind of similar to when you're on Instagram and you're a sexy girl and you show a little bit of a skin, then you get a lot more likes than a 40-year-old guy talking about stoicism or something. Shallow heathens. Man, when I pop in uh, YouTube and look for uh, Flat Earth or anything like that, everything, how to debunk Flat Earth comes up. Yeah, it's just Professor Dave destroying poor... Uh, flat Earth Dave, you know, who is not a debater in any any way. No, it's Professor Dave just t saying, "I'm you're stupid a thousand times. And even, you know, watching that just proves to the average person how stupid Professor Dave looks in that debate. It's just that Tom and I'm attacking him all the time. But, but, yeah, but you know what I mean. If I was a Glober, I'd be looking at that going, man, you know, he's making some pretty good arguments here, and your rebuttal is, you're stupid. I don't know if that's really satisfying. Well, Seriously. Professor Dave has been openly talking about, he's been reading a script from somebody who actually knows something. Dave explains, let's not get wrapped up in the conspiracy, or what's what's it called? The perpetuation, the narrative. Dave explains, is not a professor, guys. Did I mean he grifted? Thank you. <laughs> He just knows, and, and I can only imagine what his Twitter feed looks like. Oh, you called him real, you called him, you called him stupid real good that time. 
Oh, well, that time you called him stupid was even better. That's all he did <laughs> in Flat Earth Dave, man. That's all he did was call him stupid the whole time. It was ridiculous. Moral of the story is, in my opinion, if you were not told or promised that something was going to be done with the money that you give for it, you cannot call somebody a grifter. If you willingly give your money, you're not being grifted or finessed. That's your duck ass fault. Uh, and yeah, if you have no proof or evidence of someone mis mis like misleading an audience, other than the direct refutation of uh, either, then you can't really call somebody that. And to align with a side that is more closer to your bias, that's like literally the root of the problem that we face. We get so much shit because everybody agrees, even though it's not the truth. People can agree and still be wrong. Yeah, yeah I, imagine I how I feel. I'm stuck. In, I'm stuck in the. It's like I talk about the ether with glow community. They're like, nah. Then I mention the. Then I say to the flat community, hey, the ether, but it's also in this heliocentric model, and they're like, nah. So I'm like, well, fuck. All right, <laughs> don't mind my business right here. Yo, what up, Ralph? Well, I was just gonna say, uh, making a quick Alan, example. You know, your uh, ears must be ringing. Oh, yeah. real, quick, real, quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. Let me just say what up to Allen. And I got uh, my boy Shane in the building. Shout out to ADL. First time stationary Saturdays. We had to keep it open for you, my guy. Good to see you, bro. What's up, guys? Stationary Saturday, huh? I thought it was a continuation from Flat Earth Friday, huh? It is. Got to keep it moving, bro. You never no stop. time zone goes unnoticed. <laughs> you never stop. From every reference frame, we're giving bro. it to one. <laughs> Can I just add a quick comment and uh, uh, just to Ralph's point uh, about Jaren? I think your argument will be a lot stronger if Jaren was saying, can you guys donate to me for this, this or that? And then he didn't actually do that. I think your argument would be a lot, uh, a lot stronger to say that he's a grifter, but he's not actually saying, yeah. say again. I Repeat said yes, that, I sir? can agree to your point. I oh, can yeah, agree cheers. to your point, yes. Yo, so I <clears throat> I got some etheric insights as to why uh, you know both communities are rejecting the ether uh, when you when you try to talk when you try to uh, broach the subject, Ralph. So in the heliocentric um, paradigm, right, th like they've moved on from it because it's a direct refutation to the motion of the Earth, and then half of the flat Earth community rejects it because they haven't like really looked into it, so they're just kind of like you know they don't understand it, so they just think oh you know hey, they just kind of hand wave dismiss it, and then the other half that understands it is like, well, if you want to acknowledge the ether, you can't have the heliocentric model because there's no motion because when they, uh, when they take these measurements, when they split the light beam and they measure the fringes and they get their, um, purport, they can get a proportional velocity relationship out of that, like to the first order, in fact, um, which is a whole separate, um, issue in and of itself of the degree of importance. Um, but yeah, the, the main point though is like, you know, the heliocentrism is like the earth has to be moving it approximately 30 kilometers a second to make that yearly transition around the sun anything else is just it's going to be completely off man and when they took those Mickelson morley measurements they knew all about that proportional relationship how to get it what that what the implications were and when they took that measurement and they didn't get it like they flipped they freaked out bro that like that 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 experiment was six days long they took six hours of readings total i think it was and they redefined all of physics after that <laughs> like they like they knew exactly what the implications were, bro. <laughs> um, it took them how many years? Like they were in limbo for like dude, for Yeah. While. The historicity of that moment in intermission has been thoroughly scrubbed so that we have to alert you guys to what actually <laughs> happened at that point because it was ugly. Yeah, because when we keep saying <laughs> yeah, go ahead, dude. Yeah, I was gonna say because um me and Toby are about to put put together another presentation to kind of go over the full historicity of it. Like since the early eighteen hundreds, uh Fres Fazal, Fresnel, and Arago like went hard figuring out light and the relationship with velocity and ether and uh, refraction and, and different media and all that. And like by the time it came to Mickelson Morley, like they were full ready to like confirm heliocentrism and get the first one on the books because they had a long history of um, ten experiments or, and or observations that that didn't that couldn't confirm heliocentrism that they say gave a null result, but what they actually mean is they gave a negative result. Um, the only thing that they have, uh, the, the only thing that they had prior to Mickelson Morley, uh, the 1887 one, not the 1881 one, was uh, was James Bradley's stellar aberration, 
where using uh, math, they derive the kinematic relationship with the, with, the, with the orbital velocity when they ratio the angle, the full 20 arc second um, angle of stellar aberration against the velocity of light, they get 30 kilometers a second. And because it's a cosine angle relationship, they take that as being in the direction of motion. So they're like, okay, cool, we're moving at 30 kilometers a second. But even that is only... One, it's a kinematic relationship. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not meaningful. And two, even back in the day, um, in eighteen eighty. Hold on, let me pull up the date here so we can be exact. Eighteen. Where's your boy at? Uh, Etherwind. I can't find it. But anyway, back then, eighteen eighty eight, something like that. Eighteen ninety eight. Sorry, yeah, eighteen ninety eight. Uh, Wilhelm William put together a list of ten experiments that failed to prove the motion of the Earth and like. All of these experiments were on it. Mickelson Morley, the first one, uh, the 1881 one, Aries Failure, a bunch of other ones that we haven't even heard of. So they, they have a long history of just L's, man. And when they took that big L with Mickelson Morley, they were like, all right, boys, we need something fresh. <laughs> and that's when they, uh, they just started pop. That's when Einstein, they were like, okay, we have a mechanism here to get out of this and maintain our, our, I maintain think, uh, our uh, emotion. <laughs> I think Ralph stuck by himself because he took half an L. So you were like, okay, well, we can still have the ether, guys. You can't dismiss that. That's retarded. But then you stuck with all the other lore. So, I mean, you're kind of off on your own there. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, he, he's making it around, dude. We'll get him. No, but see, I, I think <laughs> Ralph's one of the good I, I like Ralph's attitude. I like the fact that, like he said, yeah, he too. said Alan sent him some stuff, and he looked at it. He, he, he looked at it, and he said it took him to uh, uh, another road. And I don't mind people like Ralph. I really don't, even though he doesn't totally agree with us. He's still open. And the thing is, if he's provided with uh, information and data, even if it contradicts what he believes, he's not going to just go, nah, uh, or, oh, no, I don't know how to interpret it, or you guys are misinterpreted. He's willing to ch like have his mind changed or altered on certain things. Well, so yeah. I don't really mind people yeah. like Ralph. No, that's why Alan chuckled, right? Because he said, you'll be one of us. Because with an intellectual honesty like that, there's like one place you'll end up. So soon to yeah. see you, Ralph. Yeah, because here, here's a weird here's a weird thing that that took me um, or that I just kind of pieced together recently looking at a at a new ether experiment or well going over an old one rather, <clears throat> but um, so before we get to that though, um, so you, you had some questions about Dayton Miller and like the dire the the direction of motion of the Earth that he extrapolated from his measurements. Now, in his uh. In his work, he states that he has no mechanism or explanation as to why the velocity gradient drops from what should be approximately, what is it, 230 kilometers a second um, with respect to the sun, or I'm sorry, with respect to the, the Earth and sun moving around the, the galaxy, the center of the galaxy, or 30 kilometers a second. He has no mechanism or explanation as to why that gradient drops from those speeds at, uh, you know, at the cosmic level to about... Um, 3,000 to 6,000, well, between 3,000 and 10,000 kilometers a second at altitude in the Earth's, or in, in the Earth's surface, right? So he has, he has no mechanism for that. So when he gets into his interpretation of like, oh, we're, it's in, we're actually moving in this direction, but just at a, but just the, the, just the speed we detected is slower for some reason. Well, he got that direction and magnitude and all of that based off of, well, one, the magnitude of the fringes, right? So corresponding to sidereal time. So he just plotted sidereal time against um, like a star map, essentially, right? So that's where he's getting his like direction and magnitude and all that because the the ether wind fluctuations do correspond to sidereal time, but it's not it's not the galactic speeds that are required, and they would have they would be able to determine those speeds because they would have first order measurements of that velocity. They would be able to get that relationship with the fringe patterns uh, with interferometry. So so that's um. So that's like a really bad one for, for the motion in terms of that. So it's like if, in, in my opinion, to like maintain globularity, you would have to abandon the motion of the Earth because interferometry directly contradicts it. And then a second experiment um, that I'm going to kind of argue, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, well, you're probably familiar with the vertical electric gradient article or article argument and how it's uniform, uh, equal potential lines and all that requires two flat surfaces to maintain that, that, um, that gradient. So in a similar respect, there's a vertical motion gradient that scales linearly. It gets stronger as you get to the sky. So on a globe, what the way that they try, the way that they could possibly try and explain the lack of um, velocity readings for the, for the galactic speeds is they could say, 
okay, Earth's gravitational field has entrained the ether in it, and then the rotation of the Earth within that is producing the um, uh, like the that fringe pattern that they get, right? But then that doesn't work either, though, because they have Michelson Gale. They have already done interferometry experiments where they've um, said that they've measured Earth rotation to 15 degrees per hour, and they say that the Earth rotates at a thousand degrees an hour at the equator. So you can't have a translational speed of 3,000 miles fluctuating to 10,000 miles at altitude, and then and then therein a, a what was it like 6,000 mile per hour um, fluctuation throughout the year that Miller measured. So, I mean, that's like the equivalent of them saying the Earth's spinning faster by like 4,000, 5,000 miles a year or throughout the year and slowing down. I mean, they're just, that's why they can't touch it at all because if they start to even, if they get a little whiff of it, everyone's going to be like, hey, wait a minute. You guys derive proportional velocity relationships off of these fringe patterns? And you and this this pattern, match, this pattern matches how much? And then they're going to reference inertial navigation systems and they're going to be like, oh, so you, you do derive it this way, but you're applying it differently when it, comes to the motion of the earth like why is that and like it's, it's all gonna fall apart um so yeah the globe has a has a really hard time explaining the uniform translation or unif what's the way to word that a vertical translation of motion gradient that gets stronger mm -hmm. as it as it radially extends outward it should be the opposite like this the if gravity is in training the ether the spin should be the fastest that corresponds to the earth spin at the surface and it, that's and it weird you know what that motion does seem to correspond with? just like off the top of my head randomly unrelated <laughs> what's that it seems to be like an intense inner vortexual spiral that emanates outward but you know that's crazy yeah well the interesting thing with that though is that we have measurements taken in kharkov uh ukraine and we have measurements taken in cleveland um and we have measure in, uh, in america right or, uh, ohio we have measurements taken in mount wilson in california so we have three data points all across the quote unquote globe and or plane that when the measurements are, um, uh, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? Put together and surmised. Aggregated? Like, yeah, possibly. A f like a full linear gradient over the, um, over that distance is shown. And it's like yeah. trying to maintain that on a globe that's spinning in the direction of motions. So like the source of the ether would be galactic right so we're flying through it and it's somehow getting entrained losing all that galactic velocity only coming at us at about 10 10 to 6 kilometers depending on your altitude and all that and then it, but it's still maintaining like a uniform pressure where that translation of motion carry c um at the same speed all across the the world at the same altitude and uh latitude <laughs> you can it's see just, why they haven't touched it yeah absolutely yeah it was because when you get when you get into um Reynolds numbers and uh, laminar flow and what's the other one here uh, tur turbulent flow when you watch that distribution go across a sphere you'll see where it doesn't pr make an equal gradient like because I because th uh, I was looking at or you tweeted the other day and I was like you know what maybe Ralph's right because Galev like why do they think this and I've seen that their model how they try to distribute it I'll pull up a picture for you here in a second and I was like okay maybe maybe I can't take that argument with Ralph maybe he's right but then I started looking at the actual models of the flow and um, it doesn't make a gradient like that. And like, there's no way to maintain it on a globe unless you have all this like ad hoc explanations as to why it's uniform. It's like an omnidirectional translation of motion pressure gradient, but <laughs> but coming radially inwards instead of outwards. Like it's, you know, it's, it's a mess. Let's call so, it a dark, a dark gradient. There you go. Now they got it. So yeah. yeah it, and, it, and that makes it completely different in respect to like, um, uh, what's it called uh, like dark matter and dark energy and all that because it's like you know they they add those concepts in to to generate invisible mass where they need it um to so that they can have things in the sky moving um as if they're not uh affected uh or let's see what's the word i'm looking for they evoke dark matter to explain observations where it doesn't fit right where there's a lack of mass because things things would be moving too fast so gravity wouldn't be sufficient to hold it so they invoke a separate thing to put there, right? Like the ether isn't the same thing because these are measurable effects with light that have a actual velocity component relationship that you can derive and all that. Like it's way, it's way different um, mechanistically and just, you know, how you can interact with it, right? So. The only 
intelligent position I've ever heard that incorporates everything that we're talking about with the ether and, you know, sphericity was Robert Sugenis, who put forth some of the best ether experience we've ever seen added to our knowledge and repertoire, slightly different interpretation, but you know, not even that really, but he took the full ramification of the motion and the ether and what it went and he developed his own, his own model. For his own, he got his own glow. <laughs> well, remaining spherical. Yeah, like, so, I mean, yeah. there's something to be said for being on your own, Ralph. That's cool. I mean, all of us had to be there at one point, standing against the grain and telling everyone else they're wrong. Definitely requires balls for sure. So, I mean, that's commendable. And Robert Tugenis is out there doing it by himself still. He'll probably be in his own spot forever because I don't think anyone else will will be Robert, resistant. Robert Bennett. Uh, sorry, Robert Bennett. Yeah, Robert Bennett will be resistant enough to the rest of it to take on it because he's – yeah, let's see. He questioned enough of it, but the sphericity part, he just didn't want to question. So he's going to take that to his grave. That's fine. <laughs> Teach his own, right? Yeah. But no, that's awesome. And I do appreciate you looking into that, Ralph, mm -hmm. and following up and sparking an interest because that's really what it's all about, man. It's just they're, they've been lying to us about a whole bunch of shit and just, just coming to just like um, opening up to one of those is really cool, man. So what I'm realizing, it's 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 a little bit more nefarious than the lie. It's um misinterpreting the facts, right? So, like I said, I was gonna get home and pull this thing up. So I guess in 1920, Einstein wrote um, an original paper called uh, "Ether and Relativity." So from the get go, uh, he he stated that the special theory, that the special theory of relativity does not necessarily has to ascribe physical qualities to space in order to explain such effects, such as rotation and acceleration. So even from the jump, like Einstein himself was okay with the concept of it, but you know, I'm just gonna have to do a little bit more digging, but there was this consorted effort to kind of either hide or display that fact. Now, could it be that that was done for monetary gain? Absolutely. I mean, we, we can go to, what uh what Firestone and Michelin and a bunch of other companies did to the Los Angeles metro system, you know, they decided to take it down for financial gain. So could the same thing happen in the scientific community? Well, it did, you know, um, the person that was funding Tesla, I'm not sure if it was uh, JP Morgan or Carnegie, um, he was funding his, his research under the guise that he was creating a death ray. In reality, he was just creating free energy. So when they found that out and they realized that they didn't have the technology then to monitor the amount of energy a person was receiving so then they could be billed for it, they decided that wasn't going to be a profitable endeavor. So is there the possibility that there was a consorted conspiracy to try to hide the ether because it could you know, provide the means for free energy? I'm thinking that's a little bit more – I'm thinking that's a more realistic conspiracy – than the actual global concerted effort to try to convince everyone the earth is round. You know, like, like if I'm going to pick two conspiracies to go after right now, I'm going to say that hiding the ether for financial gain is more plausible or probable. Why, why couldn't it be both? Hiding the ether from free energy and to make sure you don't realize the true shape of the world. Why couldn't it be both? For for the only reason the amount of personnel required to hide, let's say, one man's paper of ether, Einstein, would be less than the amount of people required to hide the shape of the planet. Like it it, it doesn't even have. So to how old are you, Ralph? How old are you, Ralph? And when did you come across these papers? Is it just now at this point in your life, or is it earlier and oh, right. you've been aware about it? Just now think about everybody else on Earth. Okay, I, I mean, but I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm I'm proposing an honest, you know, honest scenario. It would it makes more sense for them to hide the ether for financial gain because that would require a very small group of people who are studying, you know, high level concepts like that, versus trying to get every single ship captain, every single pilot, every single person on the planet on the same plan. Like it, I'm not saying it's impossible. But it's more probable that ether was 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 hidden for financial gain. Well, in in both respects, that could be the same, and you wouldn't have to teach every pilot, captain, etc. That you just give them a map and a traverse table, and tell them how to look at the stars and how to apply the table, and all of a sudden they're navigating. Absolutely. All yeah, of a sudden yeah. they're navigating on whatever Absolutely. you you tell them. 
So you would have to go back yeah, to the I, source I, I, of, of those maps, which, we, that, but, but yeah, it, which but we've done. Off chance that that one person uh, straggles away, that one person gets out of line and is able to, to, to come up with, you know, the truth, quote unquote, right? Versus a, a very small, isolated, a very small niche group of people, physicists, let's say maybe less than 200 in the world at that time, manipulating them would be easier than you know, hoping and praying that on the off chance, this one, you know, uh, wayworld sailor, this one pilot doesn't stumble upon the truth. Like, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying it's more probable that um, it yeah. is real, but it was being hidden because of financial gain. Yeah, I got you. So real quick, though, the people that were on like big sailing expeditions and actually had the means of travel to like, you know, quote unquote, discover something that they weren't supposed to, were all already adherent to, um, the people that bought the boats and shit so like the crown like the royal all that stuff they were already um were on board with all that shit so they're not gonna go and, and leak anything now they uh, the east india trading company hid japan for like 200 years from people like they were doing business with them and trading and bringing stuff back and there's like all, all this japanese culture stuff and places in europe where like they were like what where's this coming from and they're like oh yeah we just been hanging out with the japanese people for 200 years so like there's means and motive to like control all that shit, keep it obfuscated. And then the fact that they just like give us a map and they're like, here, here you go. Like that's a whole nother story in and of itself. But like, um, back to the ether thing. Um, let's see. So Einstein, yeah. In, in 1920, I think it was, I forget which book, but yeah, you're right. He did say, Hey, the, um, the general theory would completely fall apart without, um, the ether and the speed of light doesn't have to be the same. So he completely like walked back to walk, back his um initial premise on the special theory right but the special theory and the general theory are linked through the equivalence principle so they're kind of tied together in that regard so they're based off of the same fundamental so if you were to change the speed of light for one based off of xyz conditions then it ju it's really just you know it's an obvious double standard so that's why um him saying that isn't like talked about or promoted or anything because he actually, that's, that's actually not the first time he tried to walk back some fallacious relativity nonsense. Um, there was a problem with E, with e equals MC squared. So in his 1905 paper, he never even properly derived that as a relativistic effect. And for 40 years, that haunted him. So he tried six times over 40 years and republished works to properly derive E equals MC squared as a relativistic effect. And he could never do it. And at the, towards the end of his life, he wrote, I uh, forget the guy's name, Barnett something. He writes, Lincoln Barnett, he writes him and says, hey man, quick, uh, some quick thoughts on relativity. Maybe we should walk back this whole um, equals MC squared, um, energy equals mass relationship situation because it's super hard to, uh, uh, to have a meaningful covariant mathematical framework without using, he, he didn't say all this part, but he, he's like, it's super hard to have a meaningfully <laughs> covariant mathematical framework without fallaciously using math that, um, that doesn't really work or have any meaning to it. And, you know, that request was ignored and everyone to this day is like, yeah, e equals MC squared is a relativistic effect. It proves relativity is true and all this shit. And it's like the dude, li because Einstein knew, right? Like he knew how his framework worked. He knew that the tensors he was using to conserve uh, for conservation laws were would violated his own framework right he got called out by a bunch of people over that so this haunted him man and he couldn't get that corrected he, he tried he tried his damnedest and Whoa. so so when he realized the contradiction with relativity theory he was trying to get ahead of it and be like yeah man the speed of light's also different and the same and like nobody cared because it's like he's shooting his own credibility in the foot you know so let's let's read some old quotes with this new frame of reference, right? So we can take the current, the actual implication of what's going on. Remember the old one that we always used to say from Einstein, I've come to believe that the motion of Earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment, even though the Earth rotates around the sun. We're like, yeah, whoopsies, we tried so hard. We did everything. Interferometry is not your friend, right? So, so now he knows that. And then we go back to like, before he was figuring it out, like to the question whether or not the motion of the Earth in space can be made perceptible, we have already remarked, all attempts led to a negative result. Before the theory of relativity was put forward, it was difficult to become reconciled to this negative result. And then you can sort of sit back and go, isn't it ironic that the dude invented special relativity to counter experiments that revealed the lack of motion or that Earth is motionless in space, which led him to general relativity, which forced him to accept a motionless Earth, motionless Earth in the center as a vile, mathematically equal cosmological concept. It's really awkward, isn't it?
Oh, there's no Einstein defenders here. I, I forgot. Nah, it's all good. <laughs> it's like, oh, silence. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Nah. Oh, wait. But, we uh, actually might have one, though. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think Randy may be a glow brother. I'm going to tap in with him just after we hear from Proud. Let's see what Randy got to say with all this. because This is a mm-hmm. lot of heavy information. And I don't know if some of these glow brothers have heard some of this. So I want to get some of their opinion and feedback. But um, go ahead, Proud. Uh, I did just want to throw in there that I believe there's history of the churches throwing away books, burning books. So to say, like, you know, we haven't seen that information or we haven't seen the books and the studies to confirm or deny the ether, you never know what was hidden or thrown away or put in the Vatican. Like, it's definitely a lot of information that they wouldn't want us to know if they were trying to hide something. So, yeah, I don't think that's a great framework for us to start. Uh, sidebar, I did throw up a tweet from Ralph uh, from previous, but it's going to change the topic, so I'll wait for y'all to finish this. Oh, some more Ralph Blunt smoke. Oh, yeah, so I, I posted <laughs> a... Hey, What's uh, the thing in the jump, bro? Alan, I, so, I sent yeah, you, um, I sent you through the DM a uh, paper that kind of explains the ethereal flow, um, structured kind of like a like a river, and it has a pretty good diagram. Uh, you know, I, 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 I know you would like something like that, so I just said, yeah, hell yeah, thank you. Where did you send that? Oh, on, on Twitter. Got you. Thank you. Good looking out. Uh, let's see. Where were we at here? I personally still think all their experiments were just cat and inverted because they keep saying that they were trying to look for light. And I don't think they were trying to look for that for real. Look for all light. They were trying to look for sound waves whenever they were trying to see what propagated through the ether because they said they were trying to look through light, trying to see if light would travel through it. I don't think that's what they were actually looking for. That's why I keep saying when those experiments happen. They were testing for the ether. They just wrote down some other shit to say they weren't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, they gotta give us all the information, but we have to be able to decipher that shit. It's just they give it to us. We gotta do with that info what we will. So it's like they keep saying that they were looking for light permeation, and that shit just keeps going off in my head that they were not looking for that. They were looking for sound wave propagation. They just wrote down some other shit. Don't make it wrong. What would be the difference in your mind between the way a sound wave propagates through the ether and the way a light wave propagates and how it would affect the interpreted motion? Because whenever you're underwater and you're looking at light, it's always got a ripple to it. You never can see it straight on unless you unless you unless you blow the environment that you were in away so that way you have an unobstructed view of vision. So the only way for you to be able to see if light were to permeate in a medium, a water like medium, you'd have to be able to knock the water out your face to be able to see that shit. Sound will be able to do that. That's what I'm saying. Water. Like I feel like they just wrote some shit down to throw niggas off, bro. That's that's really where I'm sitting at with that. But not the people doing the experiment, right? They had scientific integrity. Like Dayton Miller was trying to prove something, even though he had some misconceptions of what he was doing, was like determined to find the truth, right? I think that's the the true of the majority of the scientific community. The problem is they'd be corralled and funded and orchestrated and dangled and coerced and intimidated to do to do the things that you know they they don't want to do and where the funding is is where you go but i don't think personally that the way movement would affect the sound wave propagating through versus a light wave would have any difference i think that the effect would be the same the motion should have the same effect on propagation through a medium whatever that medium is but then you got refraction though don't you not because then the light go hit go hit it and then it's not go it's go bending shit and then it's gonna start bouncing through bending in different directions then you have to figure that out so they don't use refract they diffract i think which is 100 percent in either way yeah, Pretty cool I, it's just i don't know bro it's just I, I gotta i gotta look over those papers again it's just they it just it's a that's a red flag in my head bro it might no, i feel you man that's why yeah. i'm asking i'm like maybe he is onto something let me figure out what he's talking about because damn yeah let's try that one but i think the way that waves propagate was was the whole the whole difference because they propagate differently underwater versus air through a medium thicker thin you know the viscosity is relevant that's why when we determined the viscosity of the ether through that robert bennett presentation that's what they had to take into account it's like you get you can't perceive the ether unless you hit it hard enough, bro. You gotta smack the shit out of it for it to be there. And that's and that's that's the craziest thing about it. Yeah. Now how do I find sorry? I was gonna say disturbing the ether. 
Yeah, right, because you can't actually see it or measure it. So you just wave your own stuff in it and you try to measure the ripples. <laughs> like, dude, like, dude, I'm in, I'm in my bathroom right now, bro, and I and I have the vent on, and I know that the vent is emitting sound to create a mini EMF to suck up the nearby air, but yet I'm waving my hand in front of me, and I can't feel the fucking ether, bro. Like, this is the hardest sell. <laughs> it's yeah so it's only measured like indirectly the problem is it's measured indirectly like with astounding specificity and ridiculous uh like repetition it's always measured the same way with the same amount all the experiments that utilize it like every satellite that pulls off a range measurement equation to get its location but then quickly calculate c plus v relative to its velocity to get its actual location is utilizing the ether right like so what I'm saying everything we do has to compensate. Like anything that you got that emits sound, yeah. bro, or anything yeah. that you have that don't emit sound that's made from Earth is automatically giving off its mini EMF. And if it makes sound, it has to make the EMF bigger. And if its only utilization is to make sound, that is so that way it can be used inside of the ether. Like cars, for example. What do you think the exhaust pipe is for? It's to make an EMF bubble around it. That's all that shit is for. It's to increase the sound wave coming out the car so that way it's protected when it's moving. They also had to use a known variable like the speed of light, right? So if light travels and it has a speed, it's the same thing as if it's already there, it travels through a medium and the rate of induction is quantified. So if it's if it's already there and not traveling, we're just quantifying the time it takes for us to see it, which is quantifying the rate of electromagnetic induction, which causes the luminosity to occur. So it's the yeah, same because we can't see light. It has to vibrate violently enough for it to appear on our spectrum. So that's why I'm like, that's all electricity is. That's all that is. It's just it's just it's just like light being vibrated fast enough for it to be physically seen. That's why electricity is so quick whenever it happens. It, it, it pops up, and then that's why sound comes seconds, because it, it it appeared out of nowhere and then disappeared, and the sound had to compensate for the rip in reality that that was, and then close it, and then make a sound for that. Oh, fuck, bro. <laughs> Faker, you remember what I asked you about the Mikkelsen-Morley experiment in the ether? When you we were doing a trivial, trivial questions? Yeah, you had to ask me when uh, when they were doing the Mickelson Morley. Basically, I think you were asking me, did they have to assume that the was it the ether that was stationary? I think that's what you you said, you said something along those lines. Right. If ether is only a uh, correlation to a stationary Earth, then would they be testing the motion of the Earth through the ether, or the ether through like around the Earth? This is his quote, but it's a long quote from before. It's Right. Oh, I didn't know that. Because they all assume they're in motion from birth, right? So I think the their interpretive framework for doing experiments is that, and you have to untangle that when you try to do the reality. <laughs> but. But Dayton Miller would be like, Earth is mysteriously moving some way in the other direction in the south going gradient. I don't know. But that's what it is. <laughs> like it's the only one with the courage to measure the motion. Hey, I want to take some time and kind of like redirect just a little bit, not to put anybody on the spot, but um, there's not many global Earthers up here. We got Ralph, but he's like halfway flat Earther already. So uh, I do want to kind of ask Randy uh, what he kind of think about Fight your turn. <laughs> we already know, bro. Can't hide behind your 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 blunt packs. Head yeah, ass. Randy, what you think about some of this uh with the ether talk? Uh some of the other things we talked about. I think you were here for the majority of like the uh trivia and, and some of this ether. What you think? Yeah, I got I hey, what's up, fellas? I got on last night, right when you guys kicked off, and I swear, man, I was out in 30 minutes and my phone just sat there like I was in the space the whole night. <laughs> So my bad. Um, I did want to holler at one thing. So I was trying to look into electrostatics and there's a lot of papers that parallel that with gravity. And I was um, just trying to understand like the differences, like, cause once you get certain parts of gravity gets so far fetched, you know, you can't really, it's kind of hard to understand. So looking in the electrostatics and the only thing that I was finding that seemed to be 
like throwing up a flag for me that I would be, I'd be great to hear if you guys have a place to point me was, you know, gravity is an attractant at a hundred percent of the time, but electricity is a, an attractant and a repellent. And so I was trying to understand how we resolve that. If we're all attracted to the earth, that means we're an opposite charge. That means all of us are the same charge, which would mean all of us would repel everything else that's attracted to earth. So I was trying to figure out how we beat the repellent in that, so to speak. That's one thing. And then the second thing was to say, I was listening earlier about the gradients of pressure. And uh, I'm glad you guys brought that up because I went through that exercise a couple of days ago. And once you double 30,000 miles or 30,000 feet to 60, it drops to 0.8. And then once you double that to 120, you're just under that um, Kármán line and it drops to almost zero. Um, and I thought that was just really cool. But I was more curious about this electrostatics repelling. So I think you're talking about the inverse relationship of Colum's law and Newton's law of gravitation, right? Uh, two of R, one of R, two of M. Like, so it's the same form, for, uh, formula, except it's an inverse relationship. I think you're talking about distance where, you know, expanding inward versus outward. That's kind of a, a misinterpretation, though, because you're assuming that we're comparing it to the gravity of the forces attracting to Earth. Nothing's attracting to Earth. We just fall down. There's a, a downward bias in the voltage gradient when you, you analyze that. You determine that, you know, there's a negatively charged ground, a positively charged top. And when you increase voltage going up, that would mean that there's a, a the gradient indicates there's two Gaussian surfaces. And because of the gradient, that determines the downward vector. The vector doesn't have a magnitude that's huge. So that gradient isn't putting any force downward. It's just determining down for everything. And then buoyancy, density, and viscosity sort everything else out to push everything down. That's the major component. The, the electrostatics isn't pushing anything down. It's just globally just, or, <clears throat> spherically returning, determining the downward vector, right? But if, if you look at the Columns law versus Newton's law of gravitation, tell me what the difference is. Yeah, that, all right. I'll look. I'll definitely look that up. What is it? Columns law. What is it called? Yeah. Columns law of electromagnetism and then Newton's law of gravitation. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. I got it. Um, yeah, that was about it, man. That was the only thing I've been studying this past week was just looking up what the parallels were because at first I was like, nah. You know, but you then know I else? started reading papers and I was like, there's a lot of papers that just parallel it. And they're like, listen, there's a lot of parallels here. So you kind of have to understand the weeds of it. And obviously, you know, once you drive, dump down that rabbit hole, there's so many different ways to, yeah. to traverse it. Yeah. You know what yeah, else they said though? Complicated, bro. If, if if you find something in there and it seems like it's simple to understand, bro, that's because it more than likely is simple to understand. Don't don't let them <laughs> complicate the shit for you when you're reading it, bro. When they when they talk about the changes in G, right? When they measure G and it varies all across the earth, wouldn't it be weird if it varied with the propensity of the electromagnetic field? Like say if we're saying it's an electromagnetic in nature and then all the variation occurs within the electromagnetic gradient, wouldn't that be a correlative analysis for us? Because they say that, you know, you weigh differently all, all across the globe and they say it spins differently all across. But at the equator is where it's sort of null. They say that's where it, you know, spins less. And that's actually where there's zero electrical charge and that's where you'd weigh less. So <laughs> why is it that all the correlations with so-called gravity and G correlate with the electromagnetic gradient more than any other factor? Yeah, and that's and that's right. And that's why I was diving down that rabbit hole trying to figure out the difference. And uh, the one thing that kept popping up was there is also when we invoke electrostatics, we have to, you know, look at all of it, which is not only the attraction, but the repelling of it. And then I was like, okay, what's the difference in air, the ionized air versus non-ionized air? Because ionized air can, can carry electricity, take a thunderstorm, for example, but most of the air is not ionized and it's an event that happens versus a static that, you know, stays present. So it's there's a buildup and then it expels it, which is lightning and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking through the difference of how does it affect, um, you know, the different gases or mediums, like what, what, what electrostatics is, does it affect what molecule or atom of helium versus hydrogen versus oxygen versus O3 versus, is there any effect? And it came up, there really wasn't any effect on them unless it was ionized and it was just mm. a charge discharge. So you I was like, like okay. you, get what you, you get what you seem like you get the most part of it. So I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm a little bit confused about what what exactly are you like, like what exactly is it still like like not clicking for you as of right now? Because it seems like you understand the majority of it. 
Yeah, I do. But there's one part about electrostatics that that is hanging me hanging me up, and it's the opposite of attraction. So we know like uh, we know an electron and a proton are attracted to each other, but protons aren't. They repel each other, and everything's got a proton. So everything technically repels if it's electrically charged, as well as attracted only if it has the negative charge. You know, the opposite of its positive charge. So I was saying, you know, the saying opposites attract, but there's so much in our environment that is an opposite, so they should constantly be repelling each other. It, it doesn't matter what direction or in air or material or matter. It just says in this law, if there's an attractive with electricity, there's also a repellent. So that's, that's kind of strange, right? So you're comparing the law of gravity with is only an attraction, but why is it the only law that has works in one direction? Shouldn't yeah, all the no, laws work all. universally? Yeah, not at all. So yeah, that's and that's why I was like, hey, I'm a little hung up on this because this is the one area that I keep coming back to. I'm like, I can't resolve this. Not necessarily speaking towards gravity, all just the just the electrostatic side of, of the of the discussion. And I was like, okay, well, if there is an attraction, um, that also states there's an or, or there's things that repel. So I'm just I was trying to figure out where the repelling was. Well, you know, it's, it gets. It's, I'm, so, I'm probably too much in the weeds or confusing things, but that was yeah, the thing. There you go. In so, of the earth or you physically so, well hold on so to understand like magnetism is kind of uh, a thing upon myself where right now you're in a half a framework of atomism with some protons and some in interpretations and trying to understand the complicated electromagnetic field theory of reality so we gotta we gotta separate that we gotta go back and say if you gotta look at it right Na nature doesn't do you know negative so there's no negative charge what there is it's like charge and discharge there's two different states of matter ever seeking equilibrium that's what it is you call it negative and positive we just call it charging and discharge if it's charging it's seeking to discharge if it's discharge it's seeking to charge same way same function but when you get into protons and neutrality and, and all that stuff that's gonna throw some mud on the water because the force is is equal all, all around right the only one that's odd is gravity because that's not real they made it up to accommodate things that, that they can't explain they haven't actually properly defined the, the downward force but they have defined all the components if that makes sense yeah, no, it does. And I, I, some context to why I was getting down to protons was also to understand ether and understand uh, like a visual exercise of understanding ourself in relation to subatomic particles, which I know is kind of off the subject, but a neutrino being so small that if you were to able to visualize and reduce yourself down or stretch your you scale your body out, but reduce yourself down to the size of something like that. Um, your body is as porous as a burlap sack at that at kind of at that level, right? So it's like these atoms can pass right through you, ether, neutrino, whatever you want to call it, um, just the different particles. And that was that was kind of why I went that far down the route was understanding because there's an electrical charge in a quirk in the quantum oh level. <laughs> so it's like understanding electricity at the very basis of subatomic levels. It's CERN kind of related, but on this regard, I was like understanding it from just a, a simpleton's perspective on the outside of that. I'm not trying to crash particles together, just understanding <laughs> where electricity lives within particles. You talk about muons and quarks, and, and if I told you there was a Shane particle, and I had a Shane particle detector, and then I had Alan publish a paper that I wrote about Shane particles, would you quote a particle of Shane to your friend with absolute certainty? If, if they had, you know, experiments to say hey these particles exist or this is what we found and yeah I would, <laughs> I would like to say hey okay i'm gonna look into this but if you know if sacred came up and said hey man i found my own particle and i called it the sacred particle i think that's what scientists do is give it their own name i'd be interested to look at it and be like what does this mofo <laughs> find <laughs> okay fair enough dude it's fine <laughs> just saying but when they when they get down to like their for propositions for muons and things have you ever listened to the rendition of like how they detected gravity waves and the ridiculosity that they went through to fake their own data and goad everyone up and then be like, oh, it's just kidding. It's a, it's a mistake. And then be like, no, we totally really found it now. And then have that be the actual tale of them finding it. That's a more credible story for turning muons, quarks, and gravitational waves. That's all I'm going to say. I think that you have the right idea, man. The foundation of electrical field theory is where it's at, but it's very different than what we've been taught. They took out all the textbooks teaching the actual thing, you know, Maxwell with the with the smallest unit of measurement being the corpuscle, which they misinterpreted back to the atom to get electrons and shit. Those people, the fathers of electrical field theory, had it down. They understand it. And that's why no one knows their names who can find their books today. So you should, you should start with them. Frankel's lecture was about quarks. That's crazy. He told me that earlier. He left because he had a lecture about quark, pop, quark mass yeah. or something. <laughs> Imagine something like Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, man.
Hey, hey, Ralph, you had your hand up. I'm, I'm done. Yeah, I was actually just adding on to your point and to uh, Shinku's point um, as far as, um, you know, the, the way things seem to be overly complicated. Like if they're trying to gatekeep the information, you really can't hide it anymore. So you can just hide it behind language and terminology. What I've been using myself that's been very helpful, um, and I know there are mixed, mixed feelings on, uh, on, on using AI, but just use the prompt of please read or re I always say please. We never know, you know when the fucking AI gets sentient. But just saying, you know, rephrase using simple language, right? And it's going to kick you back all the exact same information. It might be a couple more paragraphs longer, but it's going to explain it to you just in simple language. You could even fine tune it to say, you know what, rephrase using language a 10th grader would understand. And it'll make it work, you know, it'll work it that, that way for you. So that's what's pretty much helped me, you know, trying to get through a lot of this technical jargon because once it's simplified, it's pretty much what Shinku says. It's very simple. It's basically waves, particles, um, comparing it to, you know, the flowing of water, rivers. It's well, once you're able to get it down to those type of analogies, you're able to consume it and feel a little bit more confident in it, you know, versus fuck when we were all in school and, you know, going into a test, you know, kind of half ass ready. Um, that's what I've been using. So, you know, hopefully that can help you guys out. Yeah, it turns into a lot of reading. We have a massive library of PDFs from the stuff that hasn't been in the textbooks because when Rockefeller bought the textbook industry and decided that he wanted to control what everyone knew to make everyone smart enough to run a machine but dumb enough not to ask any questions, they kind of took some liberties, right? So when they set us off in the direction of, yeah, you can do experiments and be scientists, sure. They gave us a completely misunderstanding of uh, the you know, electricity field theory. And they're like, okay, here's the foundation of nonsense. Go do experiments and have fun, right? No danger to us if you have no idea what you're really doing. No way they're going to find out the etheric pressure of this if they're dealing with protons and neutrons and core plus. Right? Like, yeah, I, I appreciate that. So I ended up with some Google Drive God doc um, yesterday. And nice. it's got every fucking thing you can imagine regarding flat earth and then a bunch of other conspiracies. But um specifically there's a lot of flat earth stuff and then there's tons of pdfs books yeah. it just goes deep and deep and deep so yes. there's too much i could i could never read it and you know a lifetime put it that nope. way but every flat earther is the best researcher so when three or four of us get together we're like hey what do you have oh we should combine libraries and then we end up with with that so like we, Guys, we have all, all if you don't mind just a quick interruption and it's just a bit of like i don't even like to use this word pet peeve but flat earth is not a conspiracy <laughs> Technically, it's not. I just, I don't like when people kind of throw it in there because it's actually not. So just throwing that yeah. out there. But yeah, it's not bad. I don't like the name Flurf either or Glurf. I think, you know, I just don't, they don't seem to be, they seem to just cause more. I don't know. Everybody uses those terms, but I've never really, I've never really liked them. Well, Blurf. Blurf. Um, I did, I did make my <laughs> special bio for the Flat Earth Friday, but I fell asleep and I didn't get to read it to you guys. It was just for Flat Earth Friday. It was so funny, but it's, uh, I'm a little teapot, but it's like Randy Savage saying it in his own way. So you guys should check it out. It says, I'm a little curvert, savage and stout. Here's my handle. Nah, 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 nah. If you're going to do the teapot shit, you got to do the whole teapot. We want the melodies and all of that. Don't be saying in your Randy Savage voice. That's not how the teapot thing go, bro. Say it like the teapot. Go. <laughs> I can't stop <laughs> fucking laughing, bro. I'm trying to say it in a Randy Savage voice, too. I'm a little curver, savage, and stout. Here is my handle. It's also my spout. And when I get to orbit, I'll find out if it's all really flat or just for clout. <laughs> can, can you do a little dance, too, though? Because you start camera. So I was you holding know he had his hand on his hip, Shane. I was, you I was know he had his hand time. on his hip. Yeah, dude, I, I had my hands on my nuts. Like, um, I was in the scouts <laughs> to recreate the song. Oh. And it was, uh, I'm a little squirrel looking for nuts or something. I don't remember. But I was in here <laughs> dancing when I was doing it. Trust me. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so, Saker, man, I'm glad I'm glad to finally caught. I didn't know you guys were still going, but I mean to come on Friday, so. Do you guys have Globers that like you know come and ask questions at any point, or is it just yeah, man? I mean, we had you guys that just missed uh Franco, just like Pry was saying. So Franco is like the CERN physicist that popped in here, uh, spoke to Alan and Witsy a couple times. Ooh. Uh Toby down there. I'm gonna try to rotate some mics. You can come up here, Toby. 
Um, we had a few glow birthers pop in here last night, but most of them just hang out in the listeners or in our mentions. Mm. There's only like a few of them that kind of come up here. Um, like I said, halfway flatter for Ralph. <laughs> right. you, know. you can take mine if you want, bro. So <laughs> I bet they get comments then, right? You get the space open, people listening, and then the globe's going, ha, 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 silly, this is what I know that you don't know. And then oh, of course. All right. Oh, so, <laughs> I mean, if it was reversed, then I saw a bunch of flat earthers who I thought were stupid speaking eloquently about things which I had no idea. I probably wouldn't be so willing to come up and make a fool of myself either. Right? And you come in and after the Witsit effect. So there was like three, four yeah. of them that was piping up, and then nah, they ain't not piping up no more. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he one of the greats? Still in here. Yeah, they still in here. You know that? <laughs> Shout out to Globinski. <laughs> Called the Witsit effect now. Yeah, school through that's hilarious, bro. There's another Witsit effect that inspires and cultivates globe hatred that you've never seen or heard of and can, can't possibly understand. The amount of hate that guy gets is amazing. Did you see Nomino Joe in our mentions asking us why we turned off the ability to listen anonymously? Oh, we could do that. That's what I said. I said, What? That's an option. <laughs> Oh, sis, so they be in here for real, listening anonymously. Hey, yo, y'all got to chill. <laughs> Maybe we should bring it down and talk about curvature for an hour. Maybe give him some confidence. What do you guys think? Oh, we was. We actually was doing some, uh, did you see the title? It, it was, <laughs> was Level Head versus TikTok. We were breaking down the, uh, the stuff from last night in my pin tweet. But then we started doing some trivia. I'm like, that would be kind of fun. Like, some simple flat earth one-on-one questions. <laughs> right. one -on -one. Come on, you guys got the upper hand. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> It was fun too for a minute. I don't know where we left off though. <laughs> Ships over the horizon. 102. Here we go. <laughs> Bottom up is obstruction. You can physically see the ships going over the horizon and then you physically can't see them. So is the earth big or not? <laughs> you can only see the curve from low earth over it, I thought. Wait a minute. Hold up. Oh, the classics. I kind of whiz by all the classics, right? But yeah, the best out. one is whenever you ask them what gravity is, and they immediately say, well, it's whenever I put something up and drop it. That's gravity. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. But to get to the refutation understanding and the counter example, like, uh, it's kind of rough. So <laughs> it's fun to talk about, though. Like, what is gravity? Oh, they, I know you have no idea. That's what I know. They all get it wrong. <laughs> I haven't had not one globe earth or, like, steel man their own argument for gravity yet. We used to do steel man debates where we'd have like globers who've been arguing this stuff for five years, like switch sides with us for fun. But it ended because we were so angry with how little they've ever listened to us, right? A globers been listening to us for five years. We were like, ha ha ha, how does the sun set on flat earth? And they were like, I generally had no idea. Like, could not remember one explanation. We were like, what? What? All right, all right, all right, all right. Seasons. How do seasons work, right? They couldn't give us one answer. So we, we stopped doing that. And then we stopped talking to him. We're like, okay, if you guys have been listening for five years, I haven't heard a single argument. I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> yo, if that ever happens in Flat Earth, hey, yo, level heads. If y'all ever not know these arguments that we've been going over for what? Did I say 83 up there? 83 weeks? I'm going to stop talking to y'all too. <laughs> you got to test them, man. Like one of your globe friends. Be like, okay, man, just, you know, <laughs> off the book. How do you think the sun sets on Flat Earth? Just see what he says, you know? You know, that's the crazy thing is that stuff gets explained to them like in detail and they come back and say, well, that can't work on a flat earth. Yep. <laughs> so imagine how many things they told you are wrong about that. They can't even remember what you said. But you're wrong. right? And all I know is you're wrong. Did we ever talk about Ralph's question? I don't think so. About electrostatics and thunderstorms and gravity? No, I put it in the jumbo. Uh, he was asking about the localized oh. sun um, on the flat earth and the heat. I don't know if ah, I want to yes, explain yes, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Put on the jumbo. Okay, so um, fuck, how did this one go? How did this one go? So I asked the question. Okay, using the oven an analogy, correct? Um, and, I think, and I think I heard you guys use an analogy one time uh, with Rohan. So if if the sun is localized, right, if we have a localized sun that is in or near the firmament, and using the analogy of the open door of an oven, right, the closer you get to the open door of the oven, the, the hotter it's going to get. 
then as we increase in elevation, shouldn't it get hotter? You know, and then my 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 second second point would be why do we have snow only at snow peak? If and we don't have it at ground level, if you know, if using the 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 oven uh, the oven analogy, the way I'm I'm understanding it, um, if the if we get closer to the quote unquote sun, um, then it would get hotter, and ground level should be cooler. But we observe the opposite. We observe that it gets cooler at higher temperatures, and it normally stays warmer at lower temperatures. I mean, lo lower altitude. Are we so, so I didn't get to tweet it out before because too much going on. But uh, so what confused me is in your model, heat is not exclusive to proximity. Technically, the sun is 93 million miles away and 4 million miles closer when it's wintertime in the northern hemisphere. So I don't know if that's really like technically correct on your model. Like I, I'm trying to understand it. But I, yeah, like I don't know. I don't know if he is directly aligned okay, with let me read. I, proximity to uh, going to uh, space, uh, you know? Okay, so from what I've heard over the, I don't want to say 80 weeks, I haven't been listening that long, but let's say what I've been listening over the past six months is that is the the sun and the moon are, like I've heard it explained different ways, are either above the firmament or within the firmament, and that, and their, and their uh, clockwise uh, orbit, rotation, uh, uh, travel path, their, their, their clockwise path is what gives us the day and night cycle, correct? And then as, um, and then I guess they line up at certain points and that's what gives us the eclipses. But my question is, if if that's the case, if, if these uh, orbs, these heat sources, whatever, luminaries are within the firmament, then as we get higher, shouldn't it get warmer? I remember this question. I remember you tweeting this. I had uh, given you like a, a fridge analogy, and I think I'll do a little bit better this time. I had said that like when you open the bottom of your fridge, there's a light in there, right? And when you open the top, it's it's always colder up there. But because it's colder up there, it does not necess necessarily mean that the light at the bottom does not exist anymore, if that makes sense. I, I understood the, 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 the fridge ana analogy 100%. Maybe fridge is not the yeah, 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 yeah. top best, of my best way to run it. I would also argue that sound wave propagation also makes stuff appear and re like appear and disappear and also allows energy to be transmitted. So the higher you up, you go up, the less sound wave propagation you get, the less energy is being transferred toward the top, the less heat you have, the colder it gets. Are we okay, comparing? Okay. I, I, I see what you're saying. Okay, so if sound waves are used to propagate energy and one of those energy could be heat, it, it, I'm hearing you correct? But yes, I'm gonna keep mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so, but since the I'm trying to visualize it, but since know, the sound waves like are, the are lower. since since the sound waves are reverberating or bouncing off the firmament, right? And that's where we're, we're getting the the fuck. I guess, I guess the, the 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 reverberation, the yes. echo, the bounce, whatever. Should technically speaking, or not technically speaking, shouldn't it be hotter there at that point? Because that's exact. That's the point at which the energy is being. Uh, bounce back the propagation but, you know, is not as fast used... it's not as fast okay, compared okay. to whenever you're closer to the middle of the model you are getting hit with sound waves coming up coming down and left and right and everything in between but the higher you go up the less things you have to bounce the sound off of so it follows a more linear path and since it follows a more linear okay so path, so so what you're saying there's more convergence of sound waves at or near sea level than there is at higher altitudes where where the sound waves are bouncing is that what you're saying well we're not yeah. talking about sound we're talking about heat conduction guys right so if you're comparing the heat to where the sun is not on a very small localized source well, that's well that's you crazy. Gotta, well it's the thing is this well what, what, what shinku is, is saying is that is that sound is is the medium in which dude shiku says a lot of stuff dude right? i don't don't take don't argue with shiku shiku's been saying tons of random things all night all day he's just trying to derail be super loud. Wait, what? Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I mean, what? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Chinko and and Toby are in the same team. Kind of how we guys are going at each other. I'm I just trying to figure. This I don't out. know what's happening right now. Well, we hold on. What happened to Toby? More, <laughs> more, <laughs> he was so loud. More, more discontent, more discontent amongst the flat Earth community. Oh God! Look at Rob. Just no, don't the pie, dude. That's not what he was getting at.
the local sun nowhere near nowhere what he was getting at is weird right if you're gonna say like when it's dark this is not hot that's silly if the sun is in the sky the higher you approach to it the warmer it gets however it's not conduction it's requires it to be reflected right so it's, it's not, not gonna what? what i'm saying is you get you guys keep forgetting that the ether everything has to work in the ether if it ain't working in the ether it's not gonna work okay so if sound wave propagation in the closed environment permeated by I thought we're talking about the sun that's oh, bro come on man Sound wave propagation. Oh, you stopped me for ether nonsense, and I was trying to Dude, explain like I don't know. Sound wave propagation in an enclosed environment. Whenever it propagates violently enough, it conducts energy. The sun and the moon are plasma entities that vibrate high enough for us to physically see, but cannot physically touch. The higher you go up in altitude, the less sound wave propagation you get, the less vibration and energy that you also put off the less things begin to manifest. That's why the heat stops. You no longer have enough propagation to produce the plasma needed to manifest the sun to give off the heat. That's why the higher you go up, the, the colder it gets. There's nothing propagating up there enough to conduct the necessary energy to manifest the heat the sun gets off. But the lower you go down, the more shit is available to bounce off of, it comes back. That's all that is. It gets hotter the closer you go to the sun. That's the yeah, I do want to add that. that your exposure to the radiation of sun it dramatically increases as you increase in elevation. So, like, if you were scaling Everest or any other mountain and you're close to the top, you're going to get – not that you're going to stay uh, skin exposed because it's too cold. However, um, you're going to get sunburnt extremely fast. That radiation kicks in much quicker. So if that happens at higher elevations, we have to understand or ask why that's happening. Um, obviously, the atmosphere is a lot less thick, a lot less dense. There's a lot less mass. So the solar radiation heat is all permeating much faster at the top than it is down lower. Down lower, it holds itself in, in place down here at the atmosphere at sea level because we have all this atmosphere down here, this 14.7 pounds per square inch of just mass and matter and so air gas. So that's Different not what's holding Layers it, of thickness? Or, or, or is it, it, see, that, that, that's my next question. Is the firmament a solid uh, barrier or is it like this uh, uh, fucking barrier that's able to get penetrated, but it's at varying thicknesses? Like, how does that, it's, it's a if that's that the analogy... It's a barrier you can't physically see, but you have to vibrate through. You would, I would honestly argue it's invisible to us because it's vibrating so violently. But in order for you to significantly pass through, you have to match the resonance of it to be able to phase through that. Sh Shinko, Shinko, why not let some people, other people talk? We have Toby, Shane, and Alan here, there. They just got here. So, so let them go back and forth, too. Toby, you met this person before? Who, Ralph or Shikyu? Any of them? Uh, I've interacted with both on twitter i believe last night me and shiku chatted a bit um ralph seems to invoke some kind of like a crazy rigid ether model in which mm, yeah i've already there, uh, Ralph. yeah there's like he's he, he he believes in the second order magic essentially where you can somehow have the translational motion hey. of the orbit of the sun correlate into the first order measurements of the actual ether speed that we measure <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, that, you know, they would have to claim to be rotation. So it's like a whole confluence of, uh, you know, different, ro different vectors of motion that all have to magically wrap up into this one little succinct measurement that accounts for the, uh, you know, the equinoxes and is uh, higher at altitude. I mean, I admire your skepticism and resistance, but Ralph is uh is on his way, right? He's questioning the right things and is standing up against the majority in some areas. You know, Robert Bennett had to develop his own crazy theory and had to do the same, and he got most of the answers right. Like, yeah, maybe we should take a break on Ralph. No, I hear you. I hear you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be uh so much this way if Ralph hadn't at numerous times tried to insinuate that because the authors of a paper are Globers, even though the paper had nothing to do with curvature that that somehow means that I must take their full conclusion and I must adopt their favorite color and whether or not they prefer rollerblading <laughs> or skateboarding. And, you yeah, know, I like... Not, I was actually posing it as, as a question. Like, the, uh, I embrace the ether because you guys have showed me that, that paperwork. But I'm also pointing out the fact that the authors of the ether are setting that up in a model in which there exists planets, galaxies, and universes. I will concede yeah. to the point that these authors are saying the ether can exist in both a geocentric and heliocentric model. So I'm open to that too. I am now open to the possibility that the earth is in a different position, but none of these papers have ever 
uh, directly attack the shape of of the earth. They've always sta- said it as a spherical, uh, um, be it a uh, obloid or in uh, in uh, in odd sphere. It's not like a geometric argument, though. You know, yeah, yeah like I would never, witness. <laughs> I would never bring like evidence of an earthquake to prove a tornado. Right? That's insane. It's just two different topics. All I'm doing is referencing what's in the paper. I'm not. I'm not bringing outside sources other than what's only yeah, if it's presented inside the paper. Proper framework would be: Oh, the person that already believes all the same nonsense that you believe actually believes this aspect of what we're talking about. That's the context in which you should you should see it, right? Not, uh, ha, ha, he recognizes all, all this stuff. Well, no, of course he does. He's from the scientific credential things that only published papers that agree with all those things. <laughs> that this one got out is a miracle. But, but you're country. but you're using concepts from from, from that a singular you concept. Know, um, yeah, the ball of uh, okay. So you're picking and choosing what you want to use is what you're saying. No, we're looking at first order measurements and we're trying to apply those practically. And we're trying we're not making any assertions beyond those first order measurements. You're the one trying to make assertions beyond the first order measurements using second order measurements. And you're the one that keeps amending all of my tweets with weird second order crap that's, that's purely that's theoretical. That's where you miss, I'll, I, what I'm literally doing is asking for an answer. My question is why are the authors of, of the ether uh, whether it be cosmological ether, ethereal wind, uh, localized ether, all of them are placing the ether is still inside a spherical globe with planets and solar system. That's my only question. So why are the authors still choosing to do that? I mean, you'd have to ask them. I really like That's I've already I, like <laughs> I've already tried to explain here. They're using the, they're all they're proposing is second order theories and I'm not buying into their second order theories and they don't, it's not necessary for me to buy into their second order theories in order to acknowledge the concrete measurements they have made of the ether wind within our stationary realm. But all those measurements are set up in the framework of a spherical plane like i, I like I that's understand. incorrect I understand first order measurements but can, no 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 you're very incorrect. Those first order measurements of motion say nothing about the relational motion of the body you're on versus what you're measuring. That is absolutely absent from the first order measurement. Okay, if you want to try and relate it to an orbital that. motion, then you are then you have to get into second order abstractions that are not based in reality. Okay, I, I'm almost 50% sure I got half of what you got you know, just because you're using, you know, uh, very big words for me, but but I, it's still going back to my point. I understand what you're saying, and if all they were trying to do was make that point, why would they have to include additional models and additional text stating the way the the luferous ether, luminous ether, cosmological ether works? And it's still always set in luminous or models. luminiferous. Those are the words you want. Luminous or luminiferous. Those are the words you can use. It's not Luc- luciferian. I said that. I'm sorry. You know, I do have a little bit of an accent. All good. All good. I just, you know, I'm trying to, that, I don't want to be called it the Luciferian ether or whatever. It's the you can call it the luminous ether. or luminiferous. <laughs> I, so like I said, like, like all your paperwork has, you know, opened up the, the, the possibility of the ether existing. Like I'm, I'm open to that. I just have questions of why these authors had to include or did include, let me rephrase that, why the authors chose to include uh, models of a heliocentric uh, framework, the universe, the solar system, what have you. So, my Well, here, here, here's a question. So, so, so now you're talking about human psychology here now, right? Because you're trying to get into why would they or wouldn't they include something. So let me ask you a question. Since since this is directly relevant and about human psychology, let me ask you a question. Why aren't you open to considering the fact that these first order measurements make more sense on a stationary earth? And this is specifically, and this is just the psychological view, right? Sure. You're the one that wants to talk about these authors' psychology. So let's talk about psychology. Why do you okay. not want to accept the first order measurements and the fact that they make more sense in a stationary realm versus being on a, a rotating body that's also in an orbital motion that's also at a gal- in a galactic motion? Okay. The main reason is I don't subscribe to the notion of predestination or destiny, right? And 
to that only works. If, okay, so it's a philosophical it reason then. See, so now, so now you've you've exposed the fact that there's a philosophical hurdle that you must get over in order to accept the fact that these first order measurements make uh, can be ascertained simply on a in a stationary realm with an ether wind. So that's what's going on. You to, to answer your you question, have you have you can look look within your own psychology and you can answer the question so, about why these guys have to make their own theories about why the ground beneath their feet is indeed in motion, even though it can't be measured. And and I can give an honest opinion on why. And we've actually touched base on this in previous rooms about this topic, about why there is this um ideological uh preference for a flat versus round. Why? Because a flat presupposes an active god hand right god is actively manipulating everything here god is is overseeing our creation we are singular in this universe right the 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 opposing view of a heliocentric with orbits and entropy and uh, orbits decaying things slamming into each other that the heliocentric model is a temporary framework kind of suggests a little bit more of a nihilistic point of view where god isn't here or God, or, or at least God is not active. God created, God, God uh, got things going, but God is not actively here. There is no sense of destiny. There is no sense of uh, of uh, predestination. You know, we're all basically uh, left up to the winds of chaos. And for some people, that may not be a comforting view. So what I'm saying is, yeah, at, at, at its core, there is a philosophical uh, uh, argument to this. The flat model kind of kind of presupposes an active God that has uh, has singled out humanity as its special creation, versus the heliocentric model that has to embrace other planets and the possibility that human beings are not special. Heliocentric is just another religion. It's a religion that just doesn't want to believe in a God. It's what makes you guys comfortable. So that's my uh, thinking behind that, Toby. Yeah. So again, you've basically exposed the fact that it's a philosophical issue that you take with the flat earth and that you don't want to accept the idea of a God, I guess. I, I, you're the one that said that, not me. Uh, you know, all I tried to say was that in a stationary realm, you can actually you can in a stationary realm, you can actually make sense of the first order motions and you can actually make a, a sensible uh, you can actually make draw a sensible conclusion about the relational motion of the ground beneath your feet beneath versus the uh, the medium that uh, electromagnetic waves propagate through, you know, like. Our, our framework actually allows you to draw a meaningful distinction. And I didn't say anything about, about philosophy or God or metaphysics, you know, like now, obviously I do think, you know, if we're on a stationary realm, if we're in a stationary realm that was beautifully designed with, uh, you know, and, and that things aren't random, which like, you know, like the amount of logical fallacies you have to embrace to even begin to uh, uh, go down that uh, evolutionist nihilistic road is, you know, like that's a whole nother story. And I, I didn't think that's really what we were talking about, but I guess it's, it's uh, necessary when we talk about this, the psychological stuff, because then we have to get into philosophy and then we have to get into uh, to metaphysics. And, uh, but, but, you know, like all that aside, it's just, it's just a simple, like, you know, like I said, I didn't try to say any of this. I, I'm just saying, dude, like, I'm not the one making second order theories. I'm not the one that has to abstract into unicorn land. I'm not the one stepping into the wardrobe into Narnia. I'm looking at first order measurements and saying, wow, well, this is pretty easy to, to look at. If the gradient gets higher as we go higher and it matches the equinoxes, then clearly it's a translation of motion of the sky. And clearly it's a it's a measured motion that we can ascertain through the material medium required for electromagnetic waves propagation, we can actually measure what it does and where it goes and how it behaves very simply using simple, using simple, precise measurements. And it all just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's sensible in a stationary realm with a, with a, with an ether wind. And, it's not so sensible when we put ourselves on when we put the ground beneath our, our feet to be rotating around the sun and it doesn't even match that velocity. So, you know, like you're the one doing the second, the second order abstractions. You're the one adding the theory into all this. I can just sit back and be like, I don't know, man. That's your the theory. So, your theory is interesting, but is but let's just acknowledge the fact that this is actually these are actually first order really measurements. And that's all I'm making assertions about who have put the research into it. All I'm doing is regurgitating what they're saying. And you have this like major problem with it, which is fine. You're entitled to your opinion. But it's not like I'm making outlandish. Uh, well, you're not making any point of your own. That's the problem, right? 
I'm looking at it and I'm actually drawing conclusions about first mortar measurements. You're refusing to do that because they have PhDs and you don't. That's a big problem. You should actually, you should not live your life that way because you're always going to be led and you're never going to think for yourself if you live your life that way. You need to think for yourself. These first order measurements are out there. This We ended up in this crazy world where they try to pretend like the speed of light doesn't even change proportional to its uh, inertial frame. We ended ended up in this situation because people like you kept saying, well, the PhD told me. No, the PhD, I don't care about the first order measurements. The PhD said we have to believe in this theory that the ground beneath our feet is moving and the ground beneath our feet is curving away from us and we can't even measure it. We can't even see it. We magically see too far. The emotion is strong with you, Toby. Yeah, because we go in circles, man. You follow me around with these crazy tweets that you never say anything of your own. You all you you literally your the, whole point the is PhD says X. They're links to their links to the PDFs. That's all they are. It's never anything outlandish. I'm not coming at you with memes. I'm not coming at you with my You're coming at me with second order theories about first order measurements that I'm already intimately aware of. From the authors, from the authors of the first order measurements that you're using, correct. Yep. And like we said, why would they we already we're going in circles because we already discussed the fact that they actually are afraid, I agree. So philosophically afraid, afraid to admit question. the fact I that the ground beneath their feet isn't moving, that they might actually live in a significant world that was designed. You pointed out that that's the that's the log- the logical leap that we have to take in order to accept the fact that we live in a stationary cent- uh, realm that is central to everything. That was your assertion. And I agree with it. But I think it's interesting that you can even acknowledge that. But then for some reason, you try to pretend like these PhDs are magically above that as if somehow they have the they have the philosophical enlightenment and they know that the earth is moving, even but though they, they don't even have any first order measurements of it. First order measurements, right? Even though these people are the ones that the have first order the measurements disagree first with their theory. But yet yeah. they're including it in their paperwork. So, I mean, you have two completely. They include it with their, in their paperwork with a clear distinction that these are not measurements. These are second order abstractions. Dayton Miller is pretty clear about it. Yuri Golov is pretty clear about it. Even Hector Minera, his, his methodology is in the paper. If you just look at it, you can, just, you can ascertain, oh, he's counting fringes. He, he's intercorrelizing the fringes and he's, uh, he's, putting, he's making an additive effect so that he can get to where he wants it to be. He philosophically needs to be moving. He can't be the center of everything because then that means that he has to acknowledge the fact that his his actions in this realm might have consequences. And he actually has to live his life in a way in which is, uh, you know, maybe within a meaningful world. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you're good, dude. Hey, uh, I just wanted to point out to Ralph that uh, not everyone in uh, the truth or community is religious, and we don't all invoke a God behind everything. Uh, my standpoint is that we don't know what the other side actually is, but we do know that everything seems to be emanating from that side, whatever that may be, whether it's a singular entity or whether it's a multi entity. I don't know what that is, but uh, yeah, we don't all subscribe to that same thing. We're not all Bible thumpers, man. It sounds like sophistry to me. I mean, you invoke also entropy as if none of us here believe in entropy. Uh, So you're calling to the second law of thermodynamics as if we don't, you know, as if we don't hold to that. A law that, a law that to which the antecedent is order which uh, indicates intentionality and agency. So, I mean, I don't see how that supports your argument or your paradigm either. Like, I think you're willfully misunderstanding what Toby's saying. And again, I I think you're just participating in sophistry, but I could be wrong. I mean, you're ignoring the medium of air with your oven question. 
Well, that, see, that, that, that shows me that you weren't listening to what I was saying. You were just trying to hear what I was saying to pick it apart. The oven was just used as an analogy. It was set up in the framework as, as a question. That's all it was. Yeah, and I responded to all your, your uh, tweets about that. Well, well, here's a question, Ralph. Right, 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 can I have a... bring it up? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, so, so just to just to bring up in first order measurements the point that Toby was talking about. Let's say, and you said you're just waiting for for the evidence, and you've been here week after week, and you've yet to provide a, a evidence that's mutually exclusive to a globe model that would fail. Ooh, ooh, let me stop you right there, Xavier. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I haven't I finished I the question. For, no, I, I, do, I don't think I asked for evidence. You don't ask for evidence. No, I, I, ne I never, it, I didn't ask for evidence right now. No, I'm not and talking about now. I'm talking about week after week. Week after week. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I, yeah. You, I, I'm I, sure I, you're I here to find evidence of a flat earth, right? I know, but I've never right, right. asked so, so, anyone for evidence. But you're I, for evidence. Dude, you, now, now you're being weird, right, dude. You come here to find, because you say you, you're not leaning more towards uh, flat earth. Uh, your model is is a little bit out there forever. You believe in you live in a simulation that manifests itself flat. Did you not say that earlier? I did say that, but I okay, okay. So so this is what I'm addressing. Uh, so I'm addressing. So I'm addressing this, dude. Let me just ask you the question then. So in terms of first order me measures, I don't know if you were here earlier. In terms of uh, first law of flur, for which is uh, something that John had in Asia, but was uh, somebody presents uh, evidence that's contrary contrary to your claim. To their own claim and the gentleman earlier presented something where uh toby pointed out that there was a Merc mercator projection that's measured flat and they have to account for curvature uh <laughs> afterwards and the gentleman just focused on on the word verbiage in the booklet but why does it say her effing curvature <laughs> like like he's completely skipping over the point that he, that he made so aren't measuring first uh in reality more, more hold more away than accounting for something mathematically afterwards. It's a simple question. First order measurements, don't they hold more weight than accounting for something afterwards? Would you say okay. um, Do first order measurements hold more weight? Yes, they do hold more weight, but we have to, fuck, we, we really have to, to, uh, to view those measurements in, in proper scale, right? Like through the, lens, that of, we're through the measure, lens of your admitted philosophical bias, you have to view it through that lens, right? I mean, if if you if you already have the answers for me, D three, so I'll just let you speak for me. I got a problem with that too, so I'll just I'll just clear the mic to you and I'll let you answer for me because you got me. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for your answer. But I think no, I think he's heading. I think I think he's heading somewhere that you you know that you you have to go to. But just just forget what he said. But you give your answer, please. Yeah, uh, first order measurement uh, would yeah definitely. I don't want to say definitely be more important, but first order measurements are important. But at the same time, it's we have to pair that with with something to back it up, right? So let's say if I was trying to just using my own uh, senses, if I was trying to gauge the strength of uh, of a Wi-Fi signal, I wouldn't be able to do that with just my first order measurement, right? I don't have anything uh, capable to to give me that type of measurement. I would have to use some type of other. Uh, a tool to be able to gauge that. But then at that point, is it really first order measurements or is it, you know, interpreted through something else? Well, yeah. So like if I come over with a ruler, right, and I measure something to be three inches long and then Alan comes over and says, Toby, 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 no, 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 no. We need to take that three inches and apply uh, an Alan transform to it. And we need to actually, uh, you know, the fact that that three inches correlates to a three inches on that sheet of paper, you know, that actually must mean that the uh, the piece of paper we already know that that piece of paper is way bigger than three inches, so we're gonna actually have to do some do some math to the three inches that you measured in order to increase its size and make it match the actual size that we know that piece of paper must be because we just know that the three inches that you measured on that piece of paper uh, we already know before you measured it 
that it wasn't three inches, even though every single time we measure it, it comes out to be three inches. But we have to do some math just to make that three inches actually be reality, which we've never measured. We've never stepped into that lab frame. We can't, we can't quantify it. We can't falsify it. We can't substantiate it, but we just know it's there. And so we have to do some second order theoretical uh, corrections really quick. Don't worry. Uh, and, and these are PhDs, so don't worry. And we know that that three inches was definitely not measured as three inches. It's actually 30 kilometers. Uh, there you go. Toby answered it for me. So uh, yeah, that's Matt. Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, no, but do you see his point though, right? The, with with these Lorentz factor transformation, do you have to start with the abstract uh, land of abstraction? That, that So you're never going to get the evidence you're looking for if you're looking to start from abstract first. You have to start with what you can know for sure in reality. And I know reality has to be relative in your model, but you can't have that in your head and say, how do I make everything that's absolute relative? You see how it doesn't, can you see how that's a non-starter with Toby and now Zion were trying to get to you? Yep, absolutely. I'm 100% wrong. I yield to uh, to the authority in the room. All right. Hey, Ralph, real quick. Real Glad quick, you we got before, there. Uh, before we close up with, with Ralph, I, I want to apologize. I wasn't uh, trying to answer for you, bro. I was just agreeing with uh, the question that was posed because I was just about to ask the same question. So I don't, uh, I don't your, judge like that. Your right? zeal to jump ahead told me more than I need. But no, you're good. Don't, no need for apology. You feel free to answer for me all day. Again, I wasn't trying to answer for you. I was agreeing with the question. That's all. Wait, Ralph, you heard right now something? You ain't nah, heard. Right now, block, bro. <laughs> nah, he's a trooper. Well, he's no, a trooper. No, I've been I've been in this long enough. No. Yeah. The the, the skin is pretty thick over here. Hey, and if it's not long enough, you could always Lorenz transform. If it's not thick enough, <laughs> Lorenz transformer. <laughs> yeah, just tell her you need I'll that Lorenz that. transform, girl. Ignore, Size doesn't it's, matter. It's totally just transform normal. that bit. Just, it's totally normal to just ignore first order measurements and apply abstractions over them. That's totally normal. It's not normal. That's not what measurements are. Measurements are you know, you are, are taken from reality to what we call the lab frame. And you have to stay in the lab frame in order for things to work in the lab frame. Not all reference frames are equal because as, well, maybe they are, but we could never possibly verify it because you can't step into the other reference frames to actually make any measurements there. So any measurement made outside of the lab frame of reality is is, is as useful as, as uh, you know, Narnia, essentially. Uh, Toby, I have a quick question. Um, speaking of lab frames, uh, I know there's been tests around interferometry and, and variances in, in, in the speed of light. Uh, if you could give a quick, concise, uh, you don't have to go in too deep with it or go into deep as much as you want. I know you did a, a presentation on the SAGNAT effect corrections and the other correction. Uh, could you, uh, I'm going to go over it to get, get the arguments down tight, but can you give an a overview on what that entails and how that doesn't work where you need something to reference like the earth or the platform. Yeah, so, you know, you go back to the 1830s, uh, you had a, a pretty clever, a pretty smart guy, Fizeau, he, or uh, Fresnel, he was able to deduce using, refra looking at water refraction rates that, you know, you had us, what is like around a 70% refraction rate in water, but also there's a 44% translational motion of the water's motion. Uh, like, so if, if you shoot water through with stream, like down a river, it actually goes 44% faster with the speed of the river. And if you shoot it against the river, it actually goes 44% slower against the speed of the river. So they figured it out back in the 1830s, the way in which uh, electromagnetic waves propagate through a material medium, because that's necessary for waves. You have to have a material medium for them to move through. And they figured that out. They figured out the one-way velocity of light in the 1850s. Uh, Arago and uh, Fizeau both figured that out. One used uh, a bunch of crazy stuff with diffraction rates of light, or uh, re uh, yeah, with different uh, refraction rates of light. And the other guy used some cogwheels and, and shot uh, the light through some cogwheels and then looked at the, the pulsation rate, late rate of the mirror coming back over. But in any case, they understood the uh, propagation rate at which uh, light moves through a medium. And they understood that medium very intently or very uh, in, in, uh, in, in, intimately, right? That's why Maxwell, that's what Faraday figured it all out. That's all of Faraday's experiments, which is how we get to current modern day electrical field theory, were based around lines of force and lines of motion. He understood that things were connected through an innate background. And so 
we wouldn't have had all those experiments that Faraday did if he didn't understand that. And then when Maxwell came along and took all that and put it to equations, the, like the, the brilliant math put, that he put it all to, he in, 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 once again intimately understood the fact that there had to have been a background medium from which those waves had to propagate through. And so uh, that was all well understood, not questioned. There was no question about was there an ether, is there an ether? And that's why in 1887, when they came along to measure the motion of the earth, it was a well understood premise. They weren't testing for the ether. They were testing for the motion through the ether through the material medium, which is necessary for electromagnetic waves to propagate through. That's what they were testing for. And whether or not you believe in the ether or not, call it whatever you want. There is a material medium that is necessary for electromagnetic waves to propagate through. So that was the premise of Mickelson Morley. They set up to, they split a light wave and they shot it orthogonal, one way north, one way east. Or then you could, you could also do south versus west. You shoot, an ortho, you shoot it orthogonal. And then when you get those, when those, you split one light wave, so you don't have a different fringe, you don't have any kind of a wave difference, right? It's the same light wave. It gets split in two by a mirror. And then it shoot, goes down orthogonally and then it bounces and it comes back and it recombines. And when it recombines, combines if there was no difference within the time that it took for those two for those uh the split light wave to go to one end of the end and come back to or one, go down to the ends and then come back together if there's no difference in time that light will be back in phase with itself and you'll you won't have what's called a fringe shift or a, di a displacement pattern the displacement pattern is the fringe shift that's measured when those light waves do not perfectly line back up there is actually a difference in the travel time out to those mirrors and back in where they recombine and so you can actually look at that fringe, that displacement pattern, that fringe shift, and you can see the amount of uh, you can you can actually use a, an, uh, you can use a, a model, a regression model to to perfectly. Uh, differential that you saw, and that's this is well understood and they knew exactly what they were doing when they set up the Mickelson Morley experiment. That was the premise it was based on. So they shot it orthogonal and they shot it uh, and they shot it east west. And uh, that was supposed to measure the orbital motion of the Earth in its orbital motion, not to be confused with rotational motion around the sun. Right. And that's supposed to be 30 kilometers a second. The device was sensitive enough. You know, it's not it, the level of precision wasn't really there, but it's it was at least could detect down to like two or three kilometers per second. Um, you know, they actually got like a little bit of a fringe shift with it. So they go to measure it. They don't get the 30 kilometers per second. Like they set up this big thing. Like that's why it's called like the greatest failed experiment in history, because they didn't get a fringe shift. And this is all based on very well understood classical mechanics. And they're like, uh, well, this is kind of crazy. You know, like we put a bunch of like uh, hype into this and money into this. Uh, and, you know, now we look kind of dumb. And so they sat around for like, uh, what was it, 18 years or whatever, and they're trying to figure it out. You know, there's all these theories being put forth. Well, maybe the, the ether, you know, somehow rigidly sticks to the earth. But then, you know, like people are like, well, that doesn't make any sense because if it's like what's if it's within the ether, then, you know, because because we all know you can't have like in order to get away from the ether, by the way, you can't just like keep you. you if you're going to if you're going to acknowledge the fact that uh that ether is the the necessary medium, the material medium uh, necessary for electromagnetic waves propagation. If you're going to acknowledge that fact, then it has to exist within all of quote unquote space. So, I uh, you can't have the vacuum of space and then also still invoke that. It's a, those things don't really work too well together. I, uh, but so that's why finally 1905. They're just like, let's just like throw the whole ether thing out. Einstein comes along, says that one plus one does not equal two, you know, like a, a little like 0.9 speed of light plus 0.9 speed of light does not equal anywhere close to it's still under speed of light. One plus one doesn't equal two. That's what Einstein told us. And we all said, oh, OK, it was all based on he literally says the words in 1905 in his paper. He says, based on this imaginary physical experiment, an imaginary physical experiment, he invokes, uh, he uses his clock synchronization method. This just just this arbitrary method. He's trying to get away from the idea of an absolute space and an absolute time, because literally you have to step out of reality to to then say, oh, well, we can't actually measure the motion of the Earth through 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 you know absolute space or what they would say or what we would say uh, the you know the ether, the material medium necessary for electromagnetic waves propagation. And so, 
he took all that flipped it all upside down they, instead of acknowledging any longer that everything is infinitely connected and that everything exists within a background uh, medium and that everything is actually you take the atomic model you flip it upside down those little points that you see that you think about that they have us those little spheres those little protons and neutrons and electrons that's it's the inverse of what you think it is those are the counter spatial points in which the intersections are occurring those are the those are the phenomena of the uh, of the field perturbations those that's why they're so hard to predict that's why they're that's why they don't have a speed that's why they have to use they have to use a uh, you know double lorentz boosts or a coordinate or a, a, a a coordinate system rotation in order to even make the speeds make any mathematical sense because it's not an electron it's not a proton neutron it's an inversion of all that it's it's all exists everything is infinitely connected everything is not infinitely disconnected and so that's what einstein did in 1905 he came along and said one plus one doesn't equal two everything is infinitely disconnected there's a vacuum out there and there's these little photon things every the light's actually a particle that's flying through space and that's how it gets through a you know a, a a vacuum of the uh, of of nothingness i uh, so that that was what happened and then so they said it was no result right like they're, they're like okay we didn't get the orbital velocity the thing was the device still measured something there was like a tiny bit of a fringe shift there meaning guy comes along dayton miller and he's like well that's really freaking interesting like so you're telling me that light goes faster one way than the other on the earth and guess what it's no difference north to south and, and there's no difference north to south the light speed is the same but east to west it goes faster west to east and it goes slower east to west or i have it backwards um but in any case the dayton miller comes along and he's like well that's crazy let's start measuring that so he actually takes the mickelson morley interferometer and he has a bunch of mirrors to it. So basically, he just increases the amount of uh, the, the amount of length of distance that the light's traveling before it comes back and recombines and gives you the fringe shift. So what that does is it makes the device more sensitive because the more distance that you have, the more time that's being invoked, and the more distance and time, the more fringe shift, uh, the more proportional fringe shift that you can get. So he comes along, and the dude just starts measuring like mad, and he's figuring the thing out. Like he he didn't he didn't just. Uh, he didn't just come up and say, like, I'm going to take a measurement of the interferometer. He's like, let's figure this thing out. Let's figure out exactly what's being measured here. And so he starts measuring it more and more. And he realizes, like, wow, there's something very real being measured here. But if you put it underground, if you put it in metal shielding, it seems like there's less measure, there's less, uh, less of an effect measured. And so after he's do figure while he's figuring all that that out he's taking measurements and then he you know he kind of learns how the thing works and so then he's like all right i need to go to high altitude i need to take measures measurements at altitude so he goes to california to the mount wilson observatory and remember this is all based on what they said was nothing and when they, they what einstein said was a null result because now we can't have any i mean i didn't even get that much into how the fact that they had to say that literally the speed of light is constant and that it's they, like because the fact that the earth is in motion and they couldn't measure that motion they had to say that the speed of light is always the same like it, it's it's a fantasy land there's it's never been substantiated it's so unsubstantiated like you literally can't substantiate it by matter of fact you can't substantiate it because it only exists it's only constant outside of reality like you measure a fringe shift with a sagnac device like a rotating little Sanyak device back in 1912, George uh, Sanyak threw a big old wrench into the whole freaking thing because George Sanyak San come, comes along and says, like, dude, you guys, I think you're wrong. I just rotated this little device here and there's a fringe shift proportional to the speed of the rotation. Like, I think there's an ether drag occurring. Uh, th that, that doesn't really make sense with what you guys are saying that the, the speed of light is constant. And they're like, well, that's a that's a uh, that's a rotational vector, Georgia Sanyak. Let's go ahead and burn all your papers and never translate any of them to English and make sure that the one translation that we do get of anything that you ever said is from this random dude that that doesn't even appreciate your work. And so, you know, we, we get one random mention here or there about how you measure differences at altitude, which already throws the whole thing out. But that's all burned away. Can't find any of Georgia Sanyak work out about out there about that, which, by the way, if anyone finds it any of georgia sanyak's original works please send them to mir allen like we've been trying to find them they don't seem to exist anymore i uh, but in any case so georgia sanyak there's a big wrench in the whole thing so then they're a few years later you know like eight years later whatever they're like or they're like okay well uh we're gonna do our own interferometer design we're gonna do a big one 
and we're going to measure the earth rotation and the, forget everything we said before about the orthogonal uh, mo measurement of the orbital rotation because they knew what Dayton Miller had been measuring all that time. And they're like, well, let's 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 go ahead and get on top of this before this guy exposes how, you know, the the philosophical conundrum that we're in. So they say they measured the earth rotation and they put it underground and they had these big, long tunnels that they did the orthogonal setup with an, a gun. And uh and then they measure a fringe shift. They, for some reason, they acknowledge the fringe shift there, and they say, "Okay, that's Earth rotation." And then they leave it at that. But Dayton Miller didn't just leave it at that because Dayton Miller knew that that's not even the proper way to do it. If you actually want to get the sensitive measurement of that actual fringe shift, then you have to take it to altitude. So let's go back to him when he went to Dayton, when he went to Mount Wilson Observatory in California in the uh, in the 1950s or 1920s. Excuse me. He starts taking measurement after measurement after measurement after measurement. And this is after he already knew how the device worked really well. And he'd gone through tons of criticism, people saying, oh, but you're not counting for the heat fluctuations. Oh, you're not counting for the, the uh, you know, the vibrations of the people walking outside. You're not accounting for the uh, the pressure differentiations, blah, blah, blah. And every single time, Dayton Miller's like, got it, got it, got it. Okay, let's test that. Okay, let's test that. Because what one other thing Dayton Miller measured, very, very, very important to this whole thing, and and the daily there's a periodicity to the interferometer speeds the the measurement of that orthogonal motion or the orthogonal speed of one way versus the other uh that changes daily it goes up and down there's a there's a specific there's a a certain uh timing to it of a of a fastness and a slowness it speeds up and slows down and that happens year to year to year your galev went through and measured this is a guy from uh, in the 2000s he he went and measured and found he looked at Dayton miller's uh results he looked at his own results and he found like holy cow that daily thing is like very well corroborated and it's crazy because not only does it happen every day but if you look at like august 18th uh from 1920 something and then you look at august 18th from 2000 something you get a very similar uh daily period periodicity to the ether wind uh, fluctuation and but the, anyways back to miller what miller was what miller meticulously uh tested was how was the periodicity itself because he saw okay the heat affects things the pressure fluctuations affects things the vibrations affect things and that's hard to account for um but i'll do everything i can to account for those but regardless of what any of that stuff is doing the periodicity is always there and that's two different levels of periodicity. There's a space effect, which is just the daily periodicity that I just was talking about. But then the equinox effect as well. There's a periodicity that matches the correlation of the equinoxes. So when there's the sun is at its minimum and maximums, there's a that shows in the fringe displacement of the of the preferred directionality of the quote unquote speed of light that is relevant to where the sun is in the sky. It does not match an orbital motion. It matches a a a. Uh, what i would call earth time motion it's the time we exist within the closest thing we could get to an actual uh measurement of time comes from the side oh yeah so back to einstein with his insane crap about the you know 1905 when he made the whole thing up because he had to get away from an idea of an absolute time he says oh yeah if you just take a bunch of clocks a bunch of atomic clocks and you sync them all together that's absolute time. I mean, there is no absolute time, but they all, the, all those reference frames, they'll all stay in sync. So those reference frames, you can use those to measure other things against. But then those clocks start moving around and holy cow, what do you know? Those clocks don't even stay in sync with each other because the way that they're designed with the, uh, with the, the CGM oven and the electrons that have to be shot in a loop to make it back to the sensor so that they can actually take the readings of the frequency of the cesium oven in order for that whole thing to work it relies on electromagnetic waves propagation so as you move those atomic clocks around they go out of sync with each other and what do you know all these clocks are out of sync with each other but there's no absolute time einstein what are we gonna do there's no absolute time everything's out of sync but we need to get everything back in sync so we can actually have a functional GPS system. What do we do, Einstein? Well, maybe we can sync them to absolute time. We can look at the sidereal time, the absolute motion of the stars, and sync everything back to that. And then we can just pretend that we never did it and just pretend that Einstein made any freaking sense, which he never freaking did. And, you know, yeah, so 
Uh, the whole thing is bunk from the start because you have to invoke an absolute time. And then when Sanyak comes along and does his little interferometer, they have to, they, you know, the, the people that are actually thinking about it, they're like, well, we need some kind of relativistic explanation for this. What are we going to do? And they're like, oh, well, there's a Lorenz transform. Let's just Lorenz transform what we just measured in front of our face, the fringe shift that's directly proportional to one way or the other. Let's just Lorenz transform it. Who cares if we can't make any, it has no predictive value whatsoever. Let's just Lorenz transform it. And then when they, well, we can say that's a, that's a rotational vector. That's a rotational vector. It's a loop. It's a rotational vector. We measure earth, earth ball, go earth ball, go spin rotational vector. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Oh, but then Ruyong Wang comes along in 2004 and he understands how GPS works. He wrote a paper about that. And it's like, well, GPS actually relies on the one-way radio wave propagation. So you've got a big old problem right there, but that's kind of complicated for some people. And you really need to show it to them in a little local interferometer. So let's do it. Let's, let's look, let's just test the linear velocity stuff, right? Hey, uh, a Naval Research Laboratory, I've got an experiment I want to do. Oh, thanks for the money. Thanks for the funds. Okay, let's let's set this all up. Let's measure linear velocity because they say it's rotational vectors. So let's specifically let's move the 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 um, the fiber optic uh, cable, the wave core the wave core fiber. Let's move just that in a linear vector. So they move just that in a linear vector, and as that moves in a linear vector. The fringe is measured directly proportional. Holy cow! Earth ball goes spin, but then what are we going to do? Because there's a there's a linear vector being measured. So if the linear vector is being measured, then the, you know, the Earth ball goes spin. Things no 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 no. Let's the wrench transform that too. We can Lorentz transform that too. Let's let's just have some cog. Let's just another just another paradox. Who cares? Just another paradox. It's not a big deal, you know. We got particle wave duality paradox. We got the twin paradox. We got the Einstein and Rosenberg, whatever paradox. We got the, uh, you know, like this, like this idea of this cat in a box that's got food to eat, but the food's poisonous. So the cat's dead and alive in a superposition. Like, who cares if it's a paradox? Just, you know, just earth ball, go spin. Forget about the GPS. Forget about the fact that GPS is actually beautifully built on a system of, of, uh, of eloquent classical mechanics that rely purely on the idea of the speed of light not being constant. Guess what? You take that out of there. Actually, you take just the, just the preferred directionality of the speed of light out of there. The whole thing goes off by 30 meters. Like, oh, I'm actually down the street from where I am because I, I, I couldn't acknowledge the, the gradient of velocity or the velocity gradient that the, um, you know, that electromagnetic waves propagate through. So anyways, hopefully that, I think I got everything in there. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Receipts wow. can be found at Ethos Cosmology. Thank you for that, Toby. I knew you would go off. <laughs> well said. I'm all here for a Toby Earth rant any day of the week. Man, that was <laughs> motherfucking legendary. Let's go. Go. <laughs> it's frustrating. DM, DM. You go looking for it, and everywhere you go looking for it, everywhere that you get told you get gaslit. No, they proved relativity here. No, no pound Rebka. They proved it. Blah blah blah. You go and look at it. It's like, oh, that's just classical mechanics. And then you guys had to do a transform to to hide the classical mechanics. And then you and then you claim that the transform that you used to hide the classical mechanics was proof of your theory. Holy cow! And that's what it is. Everywhere you look. My man said, is the particle in the wave at the same time? The damn cat is alive and dead at the same time. <laughs> Word, paradox after paradox, bro. Thank you for that once again, bro. Hey, real quick, TM, you see uh, requests? Yeah, we got Ken, Sheep, and Conspiracy Theorist. Baba, where down. you at, Baba? Let me slide down. Let one of my, one of my homeboys come through. Thank you for I don't that. See none of those. That's so crazy. Shout out to the eleven other listeners. We see y'all. We don't bite. Mr. Swan, I don't know if you. I don't know if you're requesting. Make sure you're requesting. And Proud, you still don't see co-hosts? Sorry, no. Tear. You want to swap me out? Or how does that work? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. If I lose this co-host, I might not have none. Go ahead, Mila.
to fix it in my space, I drop um, TM and then they both can come up. All right, we're going to trust Mila. This don't oh, work. You got to remove me as co-host first, right? Is that yeah, how that works? Remove Proud as well, Um, just to the speakers, though. Forgive me if this was already discussed and, and I'm being redundant, but I've been phasing in and out because <clears throat> I've been traveling and had bad connection. So you guys might have already talked about this, but way, way earlier in the space, I think it was Gregory, that Gregory Rush dude, he was bringing up uh, his, if I understand this correctly, because I, I get smarter listening to Toby, but I lose brain cells listening to that guy. So I don't know if I understand. I want to make sure I understand his argument was because water seeks the, to fill its container from the lowest point and because wa the water level uh, is found at different elevations at different points on the earth that somehow equates to a definitive proof for the globe. I, I'm not following like was did I miss something. That was his slam dunk. Oh yeah, his his whole thing was his whole thing was that because they had to use a Mercator projection and not use a globe Earth uh, curvature model, that because they didn't have to account for curvature and they said that they didn't have to account for cur curvature that like that was the implication of curvature therefore curvature right like that was his essentially his argument okay okay like because they even presupposed it and then had to throw it out that that must have meant that it was real and then he called to a, br a bridge measurement that can't be can't be uh, substantiated in any way yeah the other dude pointed out i can't remember who what his name was um my apologies but he, he very well pointed out that like Apparently they do that, um, which to me makes some sense that that may even be by design because there's a load. Once the, the bridge is under load, that the, that slight bit of divergence that those two points might have is actually designed to be pulled in together. So they actually build it specifically that way for uh, the, the load that's going to be induced. Uh, and and that tiny bit of measurement or that tiny bit of uh well, first of all, that divergence in zenith of those of that measurement, one and three eight, five eighths inches or whatever he said, uh, it was insane to even make an assertion like that, which Alan, you know, properly pointed out. Uh, but then, uh, you know, th then that's like especially insane when when you look at the fact that they have to account for like you know feet worth of uh, actual uh, contraction and um, expansion of the bridge uh, segments themselves. And, you know, the dude didn't really have much to say to any of that. He kind of just repeated himself. Nor could he qualify his claims. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up for me. Yes. Yes. Also very important to note, he never did qualify that claim. Hey, guys. Uh, uh, this is not about Earth. I just have a quick thing to point out about um, one of our community's uh, brightest Um Winston put out a video recently, and he made it clear that uh, YouTube had uh, demonetized him there. Uh, so I'm down to like put up, put together like a little petition, or if we can all like just go in on YouTube and and uh, hit their customer service or whatever we can do to try to get him uh, remonetized. Uh, you know, try to help him appeal it in, in some way. I don't know if that's possible, but. I think we should kind of rally around him on that because he said that did have an effect on his uh, his life, you know. I hope he didn't lose his calls. Hey, uh, real, real quick, Alan and Toby, I was I tuned into your last um, paper. Um, 
I'm not that bright. So I, <laughs> uh, could you give a real quick um, like synopsis? Like, what was your main takeaways from that that last paper? Just so I can kind of get like a quick understanding. Yeah. Uh, the the hydroaerodynamics <clears throat> and the translation of that fluid motion, yeah. And also, real right. quick on that too, <clears throat> between Galev's works, uh, the one before that, the millimetric uh, radio wave band uh, propagation testing, he actually uh, corroborated Miller's findings at altitude. So he corroborated Miller at, in that paper and did a bunch of analysis of Miller's, Miller's work and corroborated within his own work as well and found the same uh, same fluctuation at altitude, so essentially implying the same gradient. But then also in the other paper, the one that we just read that you asked about, um, he vindicates Miller big time there too, because if you talk to Globers about this, that are under that are, have actually looked into this topic, what they'll bring to you is all these measurements. They'll say there's 30 times they've tried to measure what Miller measured, and they could never measure it. But like Miller, just like was on and on, super uh, repeats himself over and over again about the metals that they're using to shield these devices and how they don't actually, um, they're actually shielding from the ether wind, and that's why you know. Uh, he did it in Mount Wilson Observatory, and he didn't use metal shielding, and that's why Galav actually used a cardboard box when he did his. Um, but in any case, I uh, so what that that what Alan was talking about with the gas that gets blown over the metal shielding around the interferometer. Not only did it and did it uh, quantify that translation of that laminar flow motion, translation motion through the actual metal shielding, which is crazy when you think about it, right? That there would be a translation of motion that's a laminar and that effect can be, that can be detected by light. 
even though it's in a metal tube. But um, it also very specifically measured exactly what Miller claimed, that all those 30 measurements you guys are going to claim um, that, you know, that that uh, disprove Miller, well, they're all in metal. They're all either in um, metal shielding or dielectric insulators, both of which are Fermi surfaces. And in that paper, uh, Galev explicitly points out the fact that it's Fermi surfaces. That's what causes the whole thing. So you either have a dielectric, at least this is this is my speculation, you either have dielectric insulation, or this is me and Alan speculation, you have their dielectric insulation that is absorbing uh, the the uh, ether and and not permeate or not uh, emitting it at a uh, at a steady rate or this at a um oh, what's the word I want a symmetrical rate or you so that would be the dielectric insulator or you have uh, the metal and in that case it's a conductor and it actually uh, it actually pulls the ether uh, parallel along the um, along the axis of the metal and so then it would actually divert the ether flow outwards at least that's my speculation yeah um, that kind of made, i like I, I understand that yeah okay thank you yeah no we me and alan just uh just kind of pieced that together the other night um super interesting uh yeah so just that that's the only thing i'd add is it just it really specifically um vindicates miller and the fact you know everything that he said like it specifically measures and and quantifies it That, that was a great build, guys. If if anybody in this group hasn't uh, gone and checked that out, man, I highly highly suggest uh, going to check out that build. Man. Yo, thanks. And we do. It's Ether Cosmology. We're on YouTube, um, and we're on here on Twitter or X and and Twitch and Kick. Uh, and Alan also always streams it over at Space Audits. Um, and every Tuesday at seven p.m. Eastern, we do a presentation, um, and followed by like a roundtable discussion. And then every Thursday at around 9 p.m. Eastern, give or take an hour, we do just straight up reading. And that can be a bit dense. Maybe not for everyone. It's like straight up reading and research. Um, but if you're interested in, uh, you know, trying to see kind of how the process goes or to follow along, then, yeah, we do that every Thursday night. Shout out to Ether Cos. Big globe of bodies over there. Straight crushing. Hey Proud, you see you see any requests? I do. Uh we don't have enough mics for everyone though. But um... TM, you coming up here or not? I can I can drop down. Hold on, what? Okay, I mean, I don't know how many requests there are. I was speaking out. Whew. Wait uh, for that. Me. Big hey, swan in the building. He having issues, but it's not four Okay, people. so uh, what Toby was saying was making complete sense. I just started uh piecing up like the, you know, research that he did together. Um, there it he was like making references about you know things being backwards and back to what he was saying about Einstein lied, maybe he was lying and he had a good reason for doing it. You know, like as a researcher that, you know, works with NIH, like, you know, not everything is released to the public. And that's just because, you know, oblivion is bliss in the most truest sense and everything like that. But, um, yeah, so back to the Miami incident, like I referenced, there was this TikToker and she was literally talking about, um, you know, how they appeared in Miami. But if you reverse those coordinates, it's the center of Antarctica. And I just thought that was like a little weird. So like I started doing like a little bit more digging and whatnot. And yeah, like. The metric system with the U.S. is the way it is for everything to actually stay hidden. Like there's actual conversions that you have to make for it to like all make sense and whatnot. Like back to the uh, atomic clock thing, you know, if you were to put a clock on the base of the mountain and put one on top, like even though they're synced, the, the atomic clock on the 
the top is going to show you something completely different. It's going to show you a completely different time. And that's because of like the, the gravitation or whatever. So like, it's safe to say that Einstein lied for a reason, you know, like, hold on, explain that. So you say, so, cause I, I know we're going to, we're going to challenge you on that, that it's due to gravitation, but explain what you mean by Einstein lied for a reason. Well, like, like I, I'm just going off of like Toby said, like, you know, with the, with the equations and stuff like that. I'm not a physicist in any way or, or anything like that. I do research in a hematology. So like, you know, this is like not even like my play, but you know, like he, they were him lying, whatever, as far as. Uh, oh, you kind of, uh, you kind of rubber banding. The gravitation, yeah, I, I believe. Can. Yeah, you kind of rubber banding just a little bit. Say something. The ether, the ether, yeah. Like based on the ether, it's it's different. Nah, man, it ain't working. Got to get that. You got to connect to that satellite, bro. I, I got to disconnect to the satellite. <laughs> Either that or, or oh or yeah, or okay. So um, oh yeah, I, you sound better now. Go ahead. Is he speaking? Yeah, because like I did disconnect my um my, my Wi Fi. You can't hear me. And I think that was like the problem. No, I'll just drop. What the hell? Space glitchy as hell. Because they don't want us talking about it. They don't want us talking about it. That's a fact. That's a fact. But um, yeah, it's like it's like the truth there, like and whatnot, like he was saying, and. I, I did uh, find this YouTube video talking about the um, world kind of like not ro not necessarily like rotating, like, you know, uh, counterclockwise or clockwise or whatever, but like it's also like going in like another direction that's like upward. And I think that's like where like the flat earthers like are confused at as far as like, uh, the, the direction like where everything's like measured like where they're taking to a of like rotation anything else so like if you were to like account for like the earth like going upwards i think like you find like a better understanding as to why like the earth necessarily like isn't flat that's all i need to hear the earth isn't flat uh-oh <laughs> That's the only thing that came through clear. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> I clearly heard uh, what sounded to me like advocating for censorship because we don't. We gotta fudge the numbers to protect us from understand. Am I following correctly? And then a straw man argument. Yeah, exactly. A straw man argument about what flat earthers believe. A misunderstanding about what flat earthers believe. That's, yeah. that's all I could make out. Yeah, yeah. I kind of got the same thing. Um, I, I think the first thing I want to address is like the atomic clocks, because this is like uh, Alan and Toby's bag. Um, there is some type of a, a variance. I just don't know if it's due to gravitation, like you said. I think that's what you said. So if you want to get into that real quick, and then we can go to some of the other things that you want to talk about. I don't know. Can, can, can you? Yeah, me? sure. Yeah, I, I I can hear you perfectly fine. But um it like it it might just be because of the ether I made that mistake when I said that, but like it, I just remember reading this article like about and there's a ton of physicists like still arguing about like time and why it is the way it is. Like if you were to like go, you know, outside of Earth, like into like the first pocket, like instead of like, you know, actually being on Earth, like time is measured differently i originally thought it was because of like gravity but apparently it's because of the ether yo yeah no uh you're yo, um you're good man that's um that's what they tell people about atomic clocks you know and they give that yo, example yo, listen, bro. Clock, hold, on, superb, hold on superb hold on superb hold on superb hold on hold on go ahead Alan. um let's see okay yeah so <clears throat> a, a clock at altitude right it does retard differently than a clock that's you know at surface <clears throat> i'm sorry at sea level now 
Now, what's causing the retardation is, you know, is in question, right? So they say that it's due to gravitational potential, right? And that gravity is just like pulling on it or something, right? Causing a little retardation in the uh, propagation there. Now, what we're putting forward is that there is a um, uh, part of that could be from the electric field gradient that comes from the Earth that extends up or the vertical electric field. So as you increase in altitude, the strength, the strength of that field increases. So the magnetic uh, permeability and the electric permeativity is going to increase. So that's going to cause impedance on the on how the clock keeps time. So that could be a reason for it. And an interesting thing that they um, that they say for the uh, gravitational potential correction that they give for clocks is that it's an equal potential correction as well relative to the altitude. So in, in the same respect, like the, how they treat it as like gravity um, getting stronger radially outward, they have a correction f that matches a, an electric field gradient that increases with strength, you know. <laughs> so just... Uh, little interesting thing there so probably a similar correction because like we're talking like really fine minuscule corrections over and it's just like what's the cause of it right so and then obviously the ether flows at different rates at altitude which we were just talking about too so that's obviously a contributing factor so they just blanket roll all that into a quote-unquote equal gravitational potential uh, correction and they throw that under general relativity corrections and then they have um, when the clock's in motion they have their special relativity corrections, which we can get into later. But uh, um, yeah, you were you didn't like say anything wrong, man. You were just you know going over what they what they tell us. So I hope that kind of uh, sheds light on how how it works. Yeah, I mostly did appreciate that, man. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, now there was a couple. Of, hold on, hold on a second, super. We're just relax, bro. You just now got up here. You could wait two minutes before we finish this build. Oh, like, is, this, is this M K M M something? What is it? Is it M? What, what, what was your name? It was M something. Now you superb all of a sudden, interrupting everybody. Chill out. <laughs> hey, Baba, so you were saying uh, something about the earth moving upward. I didn't really hear it. And you said, this is why the earth is not flat. And I didn't really hear that part. Can you like, clarify real quick? Just get as close okay, to so, your router yeah, as like, possible without getting 5G radiation poisoning. You say close to my router. I'm fucking weak. I had to disconnect from the Wi-Fi, actually. But, um, no, like, so, I, like, I did general, like, relativity, like, video, like, on this, like, uh person who's into, like, NASA stuff and whatnot on YouTube. It's YouTube short. I'm going to see if I can find it and post it in the Drummertron. But, yeah, basically what he was saying is because the earth isn't just in place rotating around the sun that's not what it's doing it's like a huge spaceship and it's also going upward like it's not just just rotating around the sun like that's not just what we're doing we're spiraling upward and i'm gonna find the youtube video so like i could you know the guy could explain it a little better than i can and whatnot, so you guys can have like a clear understanding of like exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so you're not talking about the geometry of the earth, you're talking about the motion of it, right? And then I'm talking about the motion of the earth, and that's exactly why people are like confused as to why the earth might be flat because of like the general rel relativity shit. Like, you know, like people weren't taking the the account of like certain measurements that that are there and what's going on. I don't know. I think NASA trying to tap you out. Like, yeah, we don't we don't want him to present this argument because Flatter Fridays is gonna get that the hell up out of here. Uh, I still don't know if I really hear it. Now, I do agree. If you if you believe in a globe, Earth, and space, then the, the physics of the, un the universe is spo supposed to shape your world. However, I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're saying. You're saying it's not just orbiting around the sun, but it's also increasing in elevation. Like it's also going moving upward and orbiting. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. He's talking about flat Earth society stuff. Yeah, kind of sounds like 9. that. Point eight meters per second squared upward disc bullshit. Well, I don't know. He didn't say disc, right? Because you, you said it's not flat. Or are uh, you saying because because? Yeah, I I I, I said it's not. Flat. I believe the Earth is a globe. 
FI. I do not believe that the Earth is flat. Wait, you believe that? Things like the ISS. Hold on, you hold on. have people. Yo, you I don't know. Like can, can you like? Companies. Can you like actually travel to? Can you like Earth. disconnect from your Wi-Fi or something? Like just something. Maybe you should go get your PC. Gang, that's that's exactly what I did. You all connect back. Yeah, it's worse now. Can you hear me a little better now? A little Not bit, really. but, it, but it comes in uh, and out. Yeah, see, look. Yeah, it's like robotting. Like, and I, I really want to like get to some of these. Talk. I'm trying to understand how a globe moving upward at a rate of 9.8 meters per second would cause gravity. I mean, what about the other side of the globe? What about the what about the perpendicular perpendicular side? What about the opposite side? I mean, I don't understand that. Hold on, I'm gonna find the the video which I'm trying to reference, so like you can like kind of understand like what I'm so saying. Are you better. saying a flat Earth is moving up in in orbiting, or are you saying a globe Earth is moving up yes. in orbiting? The globe Earth being upward and also rotating around the sun. I don't know if I could do this. You gotta get off that Obama phone. I'm sorry, bro. That man been out of office for too long for you to be still using that phone, bro. Oh no! You do for an upgrade at this point. Dude, what? He's been out of office too long. Okay, how about this? I, I do want to double back, but I don't want like a dead air. So try to like get your connection right, reset your router, do something. <laughs> like we're gonna slide over to superb really quick, uh, and then, and then we'll double back and swing back over to, to some of those other things because I want to make sure that you can hear us, and I want to make sure that we're hearing you correctly, so that way we don't straw man each other because I don't really like straw man arguments. That's some bullshit. So. Get right, uh, Mr. Swan, and then we're going to slide over to Mr. Posh. Perfectly fine, everything. No, bro, you don't sound fine at all. <laughs> I promise you that. Mm. Get right, you got some time. You good. Uh, Posh, what up? Um, what's going on? Uh... You know, I, I wanted to ask you a question. You said ether and um, flat earth. What is the relationship? Necessary components of the construct. Oh, Jack Jack. I knew I was yes. going to remember that shit. Now, why the yes. hell you changed from Jack Jack? You OG Jack Jack. Now you superb. What the? Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, we, we changed, you know. First, you anyway. know, things change. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So you saying you asking what's the relationship between flat earth and ether? Yes. So that's like a multi-layer question, right? And you know, just to give you like a little bit of just surface layer surface you know, layer. But stuff. like how does it um support your uh your evidence? How well first it's of all it's not exclusive to the flat model either. Oh yes it is. No, because <laughs> yes, I know what is. ether is. I know what that is. Oh, what's your definition of ether? Um, ether is like basically uh, tapping into the infinite energy of the universe. That's basically the underbelly of what we see is like everything. That's what the ether is. Okay, I can get behind that. Um, more like a uh, background medium of potential energy, uh, absolute framework type of thing. Um. No, it's not potential energy. It it, it is t is well was what was said by Nikola Tesla. It can be tapped into, so it's it is potential energy. But then it's also usable. You just have to like, yeah, you're right. It's just potential energy. You could just say that. <laughs> um, but um, I just want to know how does that support flat Earth? That's yeah, because I got you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you do your thing, bro. Go ahead, cook. <laughs> Yeah, so recently we came across, so the way that we kind of been uh, looking at the ether is that it's a vortex motion, right? So um, in the northern hemisphere, we have a lot of interferometry measurements that show that there's an east-west bias. That's, that, that's uh, And to put that in simple terms, basically what that means is light goes faster when it's coming from east and going west than it does when it's traveling west going east. And then, in the, and then we found... Um, some st some interferometry readings that have kind of been buried and that are less talked about, and apparently an analysis of those interferometry readings 
that were done in the South that are supposed to prove Earth rotation. So I don't, you're probably not familiar, but I'll just list them off. There was an experiment done in 1925 called Nicholson Gale Pearson, where they had an interferometer set up in the Northern Hemisphere. And basically, the way that it was configured, they said that they were measuring Earth rotation with that. Now, in 1995, they did another experiment in the Southern Hemisphere, right? In, um, it was uh, New Zealand, <clears throat> where they said, we're going to use the same setup as the, as the one in 1995, but, you know, different, different stuff, so it's more accurate and whatnot, more sensitive. And we're going to take the same measurement and see if we get that 15 degree per hour uh, drift. Now, they said that they got that drift rating or reading. And when it was analyzed, it's, it shows that, there's, that the preferred direction flips for, for electromagnetic propagation. Now, on a globe, if they're trying, uh, the way that they've tried to attribute all these interferometry readings is that they're explicitly due to Earth rotation and that the 15 degree per hour relationship is, is due to Earth's rotation, right? As, it, as like the physical mechanism of it, right? So what they're kind of arguing in that regard um, is that, for for instance, oh man, it's going to be hard to explain it without the without like showing you diagrams. But what they're essentially saying is that like as the electromagnetic propagation, as the light is traveling through the interferometer, because the Earth's rotating, it's like physically rotating out from underneath the out from underneath the light beam, similar to how they say when you shoot a gun, the Earth rotates under a Coriolis effect. Like they're essentially invoking that kind of distance change for the apparatus to produce a friend shift that shows 15 degrees per hour. So if that were true, then the northern uh, bias that's, uh, that's faster east to west, that would have to also be true in the south for a globe that's spinning. So it would have to be east to west uh, in the south, and it's not. It, they, they, <laughs> it turns out it flips. So that's strike number one against the geometry of a spinning globe. And then uh, number two is there was a Russian guy who corroborated measurements that were done in Cleveland and in California at different uh, alt altitudes. So this, I'm sorry, not a Russian guy, a Ukrainian guy um, who did measurements in Kharkov. So we have three different points of measurements across, across the globe and or plane that show that there's a vertical translation of motion gradient that gets stronger as it, as you get closer to the sky. What that means is um, there's like, like the, the universe is rotating above us and the motion from that is translating down to us and as it gets closer to the surface, it gets lesser and lesser. So at the surface, it measures at about 3,000 kilometers a second to 6,000 kilometers a second, depending on um, how high you are above sea level and whatnot. And then when you get, uh, what was it, uh, 1,800 feet above sea level, I think it is, um, you get around 8,000 to 10,000 kilometers a second on the measurement. And that was also co or in the... In the, uh, the in between those measurements was corroborated by the guy Yuri Galev in, uh, in Kharkov. So we have this uniform gradient that extends everywhere. And if, and if the way that they try to attribute the physics of that to ether wind for, from a globe rotating and spiraling through it, you couldn't have a, um, a uniform gradient like that. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be that way. The, the flow would be different. It would change. It, it just wouldn't be that equal potential linear gradient because it's, it's linear. It's a linear relationship. So, um, the only uh, uh, okay, uh, Alex. Yeah, go ahead. This is my only problem with you, what you're saying, right? Because you're not taking account Earth's access. Earth access actually, uh, um, depending on the side of the Earth, you know, the sunlight could reach there quicker. Um, and not only that, right? You said ether. Ether is supposed to be a medium right for space right if i'm not mistaken that's just like how water is an energy and is a medium just like uh, uh earth is a medium like the earth itself is a medium because things grow within it is is life within these mediums you get what i'm saying because it's energy um you know and they say that sunlight travels through this medium of space right with ether ether is within the medium that's what they say um, but I feel like you're not taking Earth's access into consideration at all in this conversation because that actually plays a big role in what you're talking about. Um, explain you, you how and explain why it don't work on a flat Earth. I mean, if so, time zones don't exist. Like, 
Oh, here you go with the straw man. You want to take it there, There's bro? No straw man. That it's is what we see in reality. What? Because what you really saying? Watch this. Is why I'm gonna bust it down for you. What you really saying is, oh, sunlight should be everywhere. That's what you're really saying, right? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying so then what you mean. There's no time zone. We have an Earth access. It spins, and the sun leaves and comes back. That's what I'm saying. You Why know, does not work on a flat Earth, Earth is what at I'm different saying. times? It why why that don't work on a flat earth? earth at, no, I'm saying it comes at different parts of the earth at different times because it spins on earth's axis. So it doesn't spin in a way everybody thinks it spins. It spins in a, a weird way. So it goes to different places in the yeah. world and different times. Hey, you know time I, zones are man-made, right? Well, hold on a second. I got some bad news for alleged earth spin, right? So you know how we were kind of talking about interferometry earlier? Alleged right? earth spin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. alleged. Yes. Learn something. You know, Learn. There's a reason why alleged, you ain't answer my, my DM on time dilation, Jack Jack. So pay attention. This is episode nah, 83, got my guy. I'm just saying. There's <laughs> a reason why you ain't answer that. So pay attention. This is Flat Earth Friday, Stationary Saturdays. Go ahead, Adam. Get them right. All right. So it turns out that it's uh, even worse for alleged earth spin. So earlier we were talking about electromagnetic propagation and how they were trying to attribute the measurements of quote unquote earth rotation to an east, uh, I'm sorry, to a west to east rotation. Right. So in that case, the fringe shifts are displaced. I'm sorry, the, the fringes that are shown in the measurements come from the mirrors that are aligned with the east west rotation. Right. Now, the, the, the mirrors that are aligned north south don't produce the fringe shift pattern. So when the um, when electromagnetic propagation, when light, whatever, is propagating uh, with the ether, with the ether wind or against it, it receives a speed boost or a reduction in speed. Right when it's going perpendicular to that flow, it receives nothing. Now there's no mechanism for that on a spinning globe. If the globe doth spin, then the north south must uh, produce a fringe. There must be variance north south, and there is none. And then further, when you get into GPS. Well, it turns out there's the same relationship with uh, east-west propagation as well. But then when they send signals north-south, there's none. That's not possible on a spinning globe. They would have to apply the same corrections that they do east-west if that if the globe were truly if the globe spin were truly the the reason as to why the uh, that there was a change, right? They don't they don't do that. The only mechanism for that is if there's an ether wind, or if there's an ether that electromagnetic uh, uh, energy has to propagate through to to existence. So if it's traveling parallel or uh, perpendicular to Earth rotation, well, what does that matter? The Earth's still moving. It's going to have to move the light with it, or it's or the light's going to have to be in a different spot because it can't spin with the Earth, right? They don't claim that. So, so Jack, Jack, you know what interferometry it, is, right? You know, explain. Oh, see, that's how we should have prefaced that. <laughs> it's okay, like, so, you don't even know what we talk about. Okay, so well, I like, probably know what it is. For, for, Just explain it because no, yeah, I got the you. whole premise of what y'all are talking about actually has no base. So it's just I want to figure out why you, <laughs> yeah. where you getting this from because it seems like you're grabbing it out of oxygen. Because and you don't know what it like is that we're talking you, about. You're making a premise out of your imagination. These are things that you... <laughs> You're literally no. I'm so serious, bro. You know they had interferometry. Hey, yo, Jack, Jack. Earth. You know they had interferometry back in the 1800s, and you telling me that we making this up out of nothing? No, I, I hear that. I hear that. But we would so, have to discredit so much physics. It would yeah. Be like, sorry, it would be my so, guys. Sometimes the truth would, hurts. Bro, would, would, you would do, and they already sense. did that in 1995. Bro, <laughs> God wouldn't make sense right now, bro. I'm not Do you hear what we y'all. saying? We just we just broke down interferometry. You didn't say anything, How and that triggered that, me. Listen, that we, is, that triggered me to is. ask you. That triggered me to ask you if you even understood what interferometry was, because what he just but did he, was laid this. What he just did was laid a smackdown on your motion of the Earth, and you didn't even react. So that made me believe that oh, you didn't even understand what he said. So let me double back yes, to I Jack did. Jack, and let me ask you if you even know what interferometry is. Then All you right. told us that, it, that you didn't you understand saying, it, which it is, is probably why it went right over your head. And you telling us, the and then was, you, bro. and then you telling That's us that it. that we just pulling stuff out of the I air. The so way. I want you to understand the incoherency that you that you add okay. into the conversation right now, bro. To his question? I uh, as long as you know what it is, because I don't want you to speak okay, on something that you don't know about. Because I could respond to his question. Okay, go ahead. Um. So, 
I do know what it is. I have common sense. I understand I, I might not know a word, but when somebody puts different things together that it sensibly goes together, then I, I could understand it, right? So just because I don't know the, the word don't mean I can't learn the word. All right, bro, go ahead. Answer his question then. Uh -huh. Answer why the earth stopped moving. All right. So if we're spinning on Earth's axis, right, and we're flat, right? Tell me how how would how would the sun how would the sunlight work? Oh, you didn't listen to anything he said. You didn't listen to anything he said. Yo, let me slow you down. Nah, you listen, bro. You listen. You you not letting me cook, bro. Because you starting from. All right, I'm gonna let you finish. All right, everybody, everybody, shut up. Everybody, everybody, chill out. Let him get all his fallacies off. Everybody chill out. Listen, Let them get listen, all this fallacies listen, off. Listen, Go ahead. Listen, bro. If we on the disc, right, and we're spinning on the axis, right, how the fuck are we even on this planet? We don't have nothing to keep us up. We're on a flat surface, bro. That don't even make sense. How how do we even how are we even making an imprint on the fabrics of gravity? How are we making our own gravity imprint? Like, to even have our own space time. How is that even supposed to happen if we're a flat disc, bro? That goes against literally... That doesn't... That, like, bro, we wouldn't even have a, a fucking uh, electric magnet field, bro. You're saying we're a fucking disc, bro. You don't make sense. So Where? How do we have an ozone? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let him finish. He's talking let, about let, the Hold rotation. on, hold on, Baba. He didn't bro, give up the mic yet. He didn't... Let him get all his fallacies off because he's, he's setting us up for the wildest alley-oop right now. We all about to pull up 21 bro, on his ass. About the 21 zip. Go ahead. Bro. Well, tell me where to end, bro, so I could jump off that shit, bro. Where? Where, bro? There's no such thing, bro. Let me know when you're done. Look, if you go in history and go to the same people that thought the earth was flat, they also said it was the end of the earth. And then when we got older and we realized, hey, it is no end of the earth, that's when we realized these people just didn't know better, right? I don't know why you think that the earth is flat. It just does that's not realistic. That's not real. That, you that your, 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 your points contradict what you're trying to present because it is no presentation or foundation on what you're presenting. You're making this up out of your imagination. And then you're putting real ideals on your <laughs> this imagination. Dude's awesome. That's all you're doing. <laughs> you're putting real stuff into your imaginating flat earth, bro. Flat earth, it, it, it cannot exist in this world. It go against the flower of life, bro. That wouldn't even make sense. This is how I know you just want to be right, bro. You don't want to know shit, bro. You feel me? You just want to be right. You done? All right. I, yeah, I'm done, bro. Okay, okay let me do this. So, so this is what we're going to do. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Proud, you a flat earther? Yes, level stationary topographical plane. Is the flat earth spinning? Absolutely not. Ken, you a flat earther? Nah, y'all got it. Absolutely. Is the flat earth <laughs> no, spinning? A legion, nigga. No. <laughs> hey, hey, Nate, hey, Nathan, you a flat earther? Yeah, you can say that. Is the flat earth spinning? Not as far as I know. <laughs> Alan, you a flat earther? Yep. Is the flat earth spinning? Dude, he made a hell of a compelling argument. So I'm I'm on the fence, man. No, it's not spinning. <laughs> Shane, you a flat earther? If you stood here. I don't even know if you stood here. <laughs> anyway, I think you get my point, bro. What you just did was say, hey, I don't understand flat earth, so I'm going to make some shit up. And tell all you guys who have been doing this for 83 weeks that y'all making shit up because I don't understand the flat earth. So I'm going to implement things from the globe earth model because I'm indoctrinated. I'm going to apply it to the flat earth model. Then it's not going to make sense. And then I'm going to call this a psych psychological operation. You are a victim, bro. <laughs> you are a literal victim. So what you should have said was, hey, the globe earth spins. Do y'all believe in a, a spinning flat earth? We would have said, hell no. Then we would have saved 10 minutes of you ranting for no reason. We would have saved all that time. All you did was just straw man the flat earth because you have not looked into it, which is funny because we had this conversation. Let me go back to the DM. We started talking but about time it, dilation. 
We start talking about time that di- we started talking about time dilation in August 14th, 2022. It is now 2024. You have never responded to that DM. You never came to Flat Earth Friday <laughs> since then. No and sense. now you straw you man. made no sense. I couldn't respond You didn't even acknowledge the time dilation out, article man. that I sent you. So now when we're talking about interferometry, we're talking about flat earth, we're talking about motion, you still haven't done no research. Then you want to come in here popping all this shit like we don't make sense. And you're yeah, the one we're, you're saying. the one straw man. You know what a straw man is? That, do you know what a straw man is? I'm not picking for things, bro. I'm saying facts, bro. You could Google. You are not things. saying facts. I just went through the top eight people in here that are flat earthers, and I said, "Hey, do you appeal to MK bro, Jack? Jack? Your, MK, your... yo, you don't gotta interrupt because it's because I'm cooking right now, bro. Chill out. Just you in the <laughs> yo, kitchen right now. Good. Let me stir the pot. So you came up here and you straw man flat earth." And said, y'all don't make no sense. So I went to the whole panel and I asked them, hey, yo, do you agree with anything that he said about the flat earth? They all said, hell no. So that means you don't know what you're talking about. The only only way that this would make sense is if we all said, yes, MK, Jack, Jack, we all live on a flat disc in space that's spinning. Now you could sit here and tear us apart. But no flat earther takes that position because you, my friend, are confused and you're projecting your confusion onto everybody else how many people a hundred people in here you're projecting your own confusion so what i would suggest to you is approach this conversation with a little bit more of an open mind bro because nobody believes in a moving flat earth we are not in a flat disc in space no you are bro nobody agrees with you so I just I gave you the, literally I just gave you the only way that you can make that is, argument bro. is if we agreed with your position of how flat earth works. You just trying That to is be not how we my talking points. What? You told us You're how is the flat earth this. spinning and all the axis the flat earth don't spin, bro? Because the sky bro, bro, listen, bro. This hold, is on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, Nathan. Hold on, hold on, bro. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, bro. Hold on, bro. Hold on, bro. Hold on, bro. No fucking respect. Yo, when I say hold on, bro, I mean hold on. I don't need no help. I know Jack Jack. I've been knowing him since. 2021 2022 bro i got this i'm just surprised for someone who is as intelligent as mk jack jack that he done no research since the last time we spoke and then coming up here with all the weird shit talking about we don't know what we're talking about and he have no idea what he talking about so i'm just highlighting that in real time and i got the notion after we done bust down interferometry and you had no idea what it was and instead of addressing Allen and the claims you dismissed everything that he said and you just wanted to talk about what you said. Now, how are we supposed to have a dialogue like that, Jack Jack? When you ask us a question, we answer, and you completely ignore and dismiss everything that was said to you. Do you no, want to start not over? No, nah, it's not that, bro. It's just that Island is basing things off of an ideal that doesn't exist. So it's like, how am I supposed to uh, <laughs> conversate with him? Well, we're talking about motion of the earth. Why we're not even that? talking about the geometrical <laughs> aspects of the surface. We're just talking about motion right now. So I think you should deal with motion first before you talk, start talking about the dimensions of the surface. Okay. So, so let's focus on one thing that you don't understand you. at a time. Not 20 things that you don't understand. Just one. So let's now, address I, I the motion actually... of your earth. So when we're talking I about interferometry, talking about these in, no, you weren't. You started talking about a flat Earth spinning disc, and that's not what we and believe. That's in. a part of the motion. That's not the part of the motion. That's why you don't understand. Because what we're saying is that they're picking up an ether drift, and they're telling you that you live on a ball and you're stuck to it, and the Earth is spinning a thousand miles per hour as it shoots around the sun, sixty six thousand six hundred miles per hour as that shoots through the solar system at a half a million miles per hour as the whole solar system shoots through the galaxy at like 1.2 or 1.8 million miles per hour some shit like that bro you have all these different motions we have instruments that can detect these motions and they don't detect it so you have to explain what you're actually detecting if these instruments are sensitive enough to detect those motions and they do not 
Otherwise, you are going to have to acknowledge the ether, which makes your so earth I have two at questions, rest. I you understand what questions. I just said, bro? As long no, as you acknowledge what I said, bro, because you're not going to obfuscate away from Allen and then I give it to it in a no, way more layman's term said. and then you're going to ignore what I just said. I want to make sure you heard me, bro. No, I heard what you said. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm hearing you. And that's why I want to ask you two questions. Because it's like you saying something. So I'm like, all right, let me see if he, he hitting some points right now. Right? So um, two things I want to ask you is, all right, if Earth is flat, how how um how much mass does this flat surface have and how dense it is those are two things i want to ask if you cannot answer these two questions then this whole thing doesn't matter i'm just letting you know that cuz those literally, two things play a literally big a non sequitur literally, so what you, was, what, you what you just did was what you just did was what you just did was hey Allen, i don't understand what you said so i'm not going to answer you hey sacred i don't got no answer for you so i'm just going to ignore that and i'm going to talk to you about what i don't understand even though in my globe earth paradigm ain't nobody right. even been to the center it, it, bro a you don't, hey bro you hey yo, yo chill 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 you haven't even been to the center of your own globe earth as a matter of fact you've only been 7 or 8 miles down and every single Single time they went down a layer in your globe earth model they were wrong so I you trying to make it seem like you got an answer about your density and your mass of your globe earth and you I haven't know. even got eight miles down yet you are theorizing everything works. at the core of your earth thinking that you got all the answers figured out and all you doing is appealing to scientists who don't questions. have the answers so you asking me for something that you don't even have yourself all right but I, I ask you these two questions because nothing could make an imprint in space without understanding these two questions. What We're is the not mass and the density? In space. What is we the mass? Already and the density? covered that. It doesn't matter. What, nothing matters until you answer those two. You, you have to don't know have that are. either, my guy. You, Why are you asking, asking me for you, something that you, you don't answer, have right? it either? Do you, you know what's at the... I could Google it right now, bro. I'm asking Did you hear you what I said? Did you hear what I though? said three seconds you're ago, bro? One, sub, you're the one presenting You have a, not a been to the center of the globe. The debate. Nobody you in your either. paradigm has you been to the been center either. of your globe. You, you have to Google something either, appealing to somebody. Yes, so why are you asking me for something that you don't even have yourself? And you got 2,000 years and all you the resources to do it. You're the one that's acting like you got all the answers, bro. That's what You I'm don't even to have the answers to your own period. Talking about, I could Google How? it right now. So you asking, asking me something that you don't even know about your own paradigm. About space. Those We're not a disc in space, bro. Ones. We trying to talk about motion the of the Earth. The mass of this object you're talking about that's flat. Then your whole argument doesn't matter, bro. I'm no, your ass. argument doesn't matter because you're How? asking me for something you that you even, don't have. That's why you're you talking through the, me. Look, this is exactly why you don't want me to get this shit off because you know that you don't have That's you have true. zero answers. Not no, only do you have zero answers, you don't even know the don't... verbiage. You don't even know the verbiage that we're using to show you that your earth is not in motion. So you're trying to obfuscate away from me because you're in front of a hundred people right now. No, and you MK Jack Jack, Mr. That. Smart, Smart, this, this, that, and the third. And we expose you that you don't even know your own paradigm. Not only do you not know your own paradigm, own paradigm, you don't even know the <laughs> things that the instrumentation that they're using in your own paradigm. You don't even know. All right, you should be so... asking us questions about things in a non-fallacious manner. That no, would be no, more these, productive. These are these are specific questions for specific that you don't have yourself, bro. The mass actually leaves an imprint on the uh because you know how black holes are made, right? Oh so we have goodness. a fabric, bro. Right? Wait, wait, okay, if we go ahead. look, look because you you're using you, you you see how you contradict yourself. You can't use actual space shit and then go against the shit you use. You, that, that don't Nobody no, believes you do that, on a flat you earth sense, that we you are in that. space. Do you, you get you're, that? You're, how many times do I say that? to change what things are, bro. That's not how it works. You don't you even know the things how the they way. are in your own paradigm. You don't, don't even know bro, how I they work in your own you paradigm, bro. And the density of this flat surface, bro. You, 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 you probably, hey, yo, we could probably you pack you up with gravity point, right you now. You have a, a time space, your own time space. Where you I'm didn't even the answer right the time mass, dilation bro. article that I sent you. Don't talk to me about you time and space. If you this, didn't, if you didn't read the time dilation article that I sent you, don't talk to me about time and space. It don't matter if you don't know the math. Exactly. You don't want to. You're not here to learn. You only here to talk shit. And you getting 
exposed in real time. You talking about shit that you don't know. You talking about shit that you you talking to me about time and space, and you didn't even read the article that refuted your position about time dilation. Period. Next. Time dilation. I'm asking you, what is the density of mass of this flat surface? Which has so nothing to do with the motion where of the we Earth. Can place this in space. It's not a disc in space. How many times I gotta say that? Are you thick, bro? All right, so what is it? So tell it's me a what flat it is. plane, and there's a sky. That's it. All right. So how with how a firmament dense and mass is this flat plane that you're talking? Nobody about? knows. Just like you don't know about wow, your own globe. Nobody knows. Just you like you don't know. So how did they nobody measure the density knows, of the Just like you do don't know. How did they do Yo, it for your bro, model? I'm good, bro. How did they do it? Yeah, you is good. Just you got packed <laughs> up. Just How like they, that, you don't know interferometry. You don't know motion nah, of the bro, earth. You don't know that. how. You don't know how gravity works. I you don't know not nothing that, about bro. that shit, bro, at all. You know, I'm really, black I really know what I'm talking about. That's the thing. You really? really? Black hole. So how did they get the density of globe Earth? Go ahead. How did they get the density of Earth? You heard her. They have technology, bro. So like what? Don't have. They like have what? Money. Something we don't got. So like what? Be specific, <laughs> Jack Jack. We only know what they tell us. We don't have. Oh, so you appealing to you appealing to other men without knowing anything about your own paradigm? Then. So no, I'm not saying that. that. I'm you saying literally just. Said, oh, did you? <laughs> Yo, bro. <laughs> technology detection. I'm just saying, you know, it, the the whole basis of we're on a surface. We have to know how big this surface is, how dense it is. For and it how did actually? You, how did you get a radius? Like, Hey Jack Jack, how did well, you get I'm a saying, radius? Like if we was Jack, on Jack. a brick this whole time. Jack bro, Jack, how'd like, you get a radius? On a brick right now? Let Jack me know Jack, how did you get a radius? Brick. Jack Jack, how do you get a radius? How do I do I look like a fucking astro scientist? So you don't know how you got a radius, you don't know how you got the density of your earth, you don't know how it mo the motion moves, you don't know I nothing about gravity, how. you don't know nothing so about time dilation. How many times I do I gotta name off all the things that you are completely ignorant to in your own paradigm, Jack Jack? But you feel comfortable bringing it up and invoking black holes. You can't talk about when black did, holes if you can't even get to the, you, the to the center of your own it's earth. A point. Dude, it's a point that y'all don't want to discuss. Y'all keep trying to invert it back to Let's me. Talk about black uh, holes. When we were talking you about motion. To try to get over it. And it's just it like, why can't model. we just dive into the actual mass and the density of this I, black hole? I asked you how they derived that for your model, and you said technology, but you have no idea what technology it is, how they did it, if it's even on earth or in space. So I'm asking you now. Well, well, now you're you trying to discredit information that is factual. You could Google it right now. Yo, you are a bot. You are a bot, yo. Why don't you know what it is? Just like you can learn about your flat earth. You could do so, the same so, shit. It's so, no different, bro. So did, you you did you hear what I said? Yo, hey, yo. You want to come at me? Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said when I said when they... All right. Did you hear what I said when I said when they went to go dig down to the surface of the earth as far as they could? Every layer that they went down, they were incorrect. They said, hey, we about to get to the, to the center of the earth. They went down eight miles. They said, when we get to this layer, it's got to be this. Ant wrong. Okay, when we get to this layer, it got to be this. Ant wrong. So we ask you, so if, you, if they got it wrong every single mile down to eight miles, like how can you tell me what the density of the earth is? And you don't even know the instrumentation that they used. You exposing yourself for ignorance for no reason. Tell me the article is said that they they didn't know anything about the shit they was digging down into. So you want me to do the homework for you for your own paradigm that you believe nah, in that I don't believe in, but I know more about bro, it than you. Bro. That's interesting. Like, it, it is That's a part interesting. Of, it That's is a interesting. Part of the lower earth that they didn't know about, but the mass majority of what the fuck is under us, they knew what the fuck was under us. And they just like, then, what? then show me that. Then, then go ahead and find that article. So uh, Jack, Jack. When do we find minerals? You How tell us, Jack Jack. Go minerals, tell bro? go go get us an article where it says, Yeah, How we knew this. Ago was humans mining Jack Jack, you gonna go get that article or not? Saying, bro. You didn't want to acknowledge my time dilation, We've so you want to go get the gold, other you want to go get the other article for the density of the earth or not? Bro, all I'm trying to say is, bro, so you don't want to get it. That you, your basis is imagination, so it doesn't matter. You don't even know what we're talking about. You don't even know what interferometry is. You don't even know what interferometry is. 
Bro, you can't answer the two questions I asked you, bro. This I did answer. I said, don't nobody question, know, bro. bro. Don't nobody know. We've only been so down eight why miles. You, why are we having this conversation? You don't even Because know you're invoking you something that you doesn't even... It's, it's literally a non sequitur. So Alan was talking to you How, about the motion bro? of... I'm telling you right now. Alan was talking to you about the motion of the earth. And that they didn't detect any. And you didn't understand that. So you wanted to talk about density bro, that of the earth. that doesn't matter. Like, See exactly, y'all hear this right? So we talk about motion of the Earth. None there is matters. none detected, and now he's saying, "Hey, even though my Earth is moving five different ways, two million matter. miles per hour, Your and they can't detect it, flawed. it doesn't matter, guys." Y'all hear this? This is a this this is what you call right here a globe tar. This right here is a globe tar heliosexual. This is a person that appeals to balls. You cannot say where is the end of the flat surface. But and you can't tell me what's at the center of your globe, Earth. You can't even tell me how deep it is. You can't. You can't even either. Tell me how dense it is. You can't because, either. But you're the one presenting. You're the one. You're the one. How We're you talking you? about you're the motion the of the you're earth. The Every argument. single argument that you're bringing up, you don't have any idea about the established facts. We could tell you the established facts. What's the it radius of the globe earth? Because your yeah, because you don't know. You don't know the your radius of the earth. You don't know how exist. the center of the earth works. You don't know what the you geodynamal know, model is. You, you, you don't know what the circumference of the earth is. You don't know the distance to the moon. You don't know the distance to the sun. You don't know how gravity works. You don't know anything, bro. How I don't know how gravity works, bro. Which gravity you subscribe to? Which gravity do you subscribe to? Gravity is a wavelength, right? If I'm not mistaken. Gravity is a wavelength? Right? <laughs> hey, Alan, please queue up the stream. Yo, oh, gravity is a <laughs> wavelength? Oh, man. It's not a wave of energy? Oh my goodness, so, bro. Might want to consult. You, need a citation for that. you know what, bro? For that. You know what? You know what? Y'all gonna y'all gonna see what I'm saying later. Y'all, y'all, y'all be later. later. How later? Another two thousand years? How long how much later do you need to figure out gravity? Jack Jack? Y'all niggas is late as fuck, bro. Y'all don't even know what I'm saying. That's sad. That's yeah, sad. nobody knows what you're saying. Please you show me where it says gravity sad, is. A, yeah. That means that you need to go read a book again, bro. Because so, so who do you appeal to? So generally so, in the science community, bro. So who? So, so you appeal to relativity then? He appeals to Google. Newtonian mechanics, quantum mechanics. What gravity you subscribe to, bro? Bro, listen. Jack, Jack, answer the question. Just answer one question before you get up out of here. After we get you listen, cooked up, it, it, just listen, answer listen, one question. That, what gravity listen, see, do you subscribe to? Is, You're not gonna answer no question. question. You're just gonna come up here and just mumble a bunch of things that you don't understand. Your your base is imagination, so it doesn't matter. So you just going you just, you're just gonna you ignore all of the all the instrumentation. You you're gonna ignore your all the documentation, all the instruments that you don't understand, and you're gonna just say we're based in imagination when we're the one referencing the instruments, it we're is. the one referencing the dynamics and the mechanics, and you don't because have anything. You could do that. You don't have a base. You don't have nothing to base. We are before. literally referencing so you instrumentation. You no, it's called instrumentation. Interferometry. No, it's that's what it is. That's what that is. Bro. And that's you have no it. idea what, what it is, Jack. Mean. Jack, you got no idea what it is. That's why you're not answering. Everybody can see. That's why you're so spiraling out of control right now because you're getting exposed in real time that you don't know nothing about what you're talking about. How am I getting exposed, bro? What's interferometry, like, Jack? Why, Jack, why are you so hooked on this? Why is what is interferometry, <laughs> Jack? Jack, like I didn't know that. Like Jack, Jack, what bro. is interferometry? You tell me what it is, bro. Exactly, because you don't know. So everything that we're talking about do. is going right over your ask peanut me. head, I bro. Mean, uh, not ask me. Tell me what it is. Because you don't know, do you? Are you going to tell me or you want to just... No, I want to, you to uh, answer the question what I you asked you. What is interferometry? Alkalates. You're trying to make alkalates out of this and fucking... I didn't cool, tell you to bro. come up here. I didn't tell you to come up here. I'm just saying, bro. You, I didn't tell you to the, come the up here, Jack. Jack, addressing this conversation, it just seems disingenuous. You not really. So when this we're talking about the motion of the thing. Earth, and we're talking about specific instrumentation designed to detect the motion of the Earth, and then we tell you that this instrumentation, and we reference all the physicists that use this instrumentation it, to detect the motion of the Earth, and then they did it. Okay, so Why are you ignoring that to talk about density of the Earth, which uh, okay, you don't even so have yourself? 
I'm going to tell you why. Because everything in, in science today that has to do with space, all the scientists base everything they know off of those two things, bro. The density and the amount of, of mass the Earth is. If those two things didn't happen, bro, then everything in physics that we know right now wouldn't exist, bro. All this That's shit that why know, it's Flatter Fridays, episode look, 83. I come to We're you with the same, listen, this is why I bro. come to you with the same thing and ask you how dense and how mass this flat plane is. Because everything you're saying, it doesn't have an actual base of an argument if you don't exact, you don't explain that. You, you don't even know your whole build. your whole globe Science earth is tip. dependent on hey yo, I'll let you talk. Your whole globe earth is dependent on gravity, and you haven't even told us what gravity you subscribe to. You haven't even told us what how gravity works. So you talking about something being dependent, it don't matter the density or the mass of the earth if it's flat, if we're not in motion. Let me repeat that. If we are stationary, the density and the mass does not matter. It only matters if you're in motion. We directly refuted that with interferometry. If you don't know that, then you are unequipped to have the conversation with flat earthers. You should go up your intellect before you come in here. Pipe and shit about things you don't understand. Well, my guy. explain, explain, explain your argument, bro. I why, just why did. Is that so hard what did you? Hey, I, Jack, I Jack. Jack. Like I literally, literally, like you, you can't, yo, literally was the first thing, the, the literal first thing I did was give Alan the floor to explain to you about the lack of motion of the earth. That's the first thing I did. The reason why we're here now is because you got silent. It went crickets. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. Jack-Jack don't ever stay shut. Clearly, you haven't shut the fuck up yet and still ain't answering no question. So that raised a little red flag. Like, wait a minute. Jack-Jack, shut the fuck up. Yo, bro, do you even understand what he said? It don't matter. What you mean it don't matter? You don't know what interferometry is? It don't matter. <laughs> like, bro, are you kidding me? Listen, listen. So you telling me that we I didn't do something that we matter. literally did. Look. You said you explain know, it. You said explain it, bro. And Alan that, just explained it. You want him to do it again for you? We don't know the we don't know the mass or the density. So it it's don't not matter. Moving. It doesn't matter. You say it's all not of this stuff, moving. It's not moving. But we don't have a, a well, wait. We don't have nothing to say how fast this shit will move or not. It's so not it's like, you're just moving. Hey, bro, oh, you got a, hey, yo, bro, hey, yo, bro, hey, yo, bro. If yeah, you got a speedometer on your car and you hit the gas and then the speedometer stay at zero, you're not going to say, well, what's the, what's the density of the car? How big is the car? Like, it's not moving, bro. <laughs> it doesn't matter. This is what we're telling you. You have instrumentation on your car so you can see how fast you're going. We have similar instrumentation. Guess what? It's not in space. It's in the lab frame of Earth on the surface. It didn't detect motion. At least not what they predicted. That's a problem for you. But you have to be intellectually equipped to address the issue. If you are not, you're going to be just rambling on for the past 30 minutes like you've been doing this whole time. So address okay, Alan. I Address what he said. Hello. If if you'd like a quick recap, I can kind of reincorporate my argument to address your issues with gravity and weight and all that, if you'd like. Oh, you you're here to actually talk to me like a human. What's going on, Alan? You said yeah. what? Like a way. That's how we started it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so your the basis for your argument is from what I'm understanding here is that you want to know how dense and like the mass of the earth, right? Because the equations they use, you know, when they describe celestial phenomenon and whatnot is in relation to um, the mass of the earth when primarily the mass of the sun and then how everything revolves around it. Is that kind of what you're getting at? But if there's, if there's a mass of the earth, there should be some force interaction between the earth and the sun. Is that kind of what you're getting at? No, I'm just getting at the whole entire, uh, the whole entire thing, like Earth access wouldn't even spin correctly. It will always, we will flip out of orbit 
if this if we were going around the sun, we were flat, we will flip out of orbit. That wouldn't even make sense. So he has to have more understandable yeah. evidence because nah. that that doesn't correlate. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, absolutely, man. Hey, I'm gonna head out. Sacred, proud. Uh, I'll catch you guys. <laughs> catch you guys later. Alan said, yeah. "I'm not doing this." My I boy, see, I you, bro. My boy Dave said that if you want to tag him in, he could talk to him about planes. Get like a more practical application on it, and see if that, see if that'll uh, take. Dave should be in the uh, viewer section. Oh, that's or, a new perspective. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, bro. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> yeah, no worries, yo, superb. It was it was nice talking to you, bro. Peace nah, out. it was nice talking to you, bro. You got common sense at least. Shit. <laughs>